Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the uh, BNSSG uh, ICB uh, board meeting. Um, a reminder to everybody, this is a meeting in public. It's not a public meeting, but it is a meeting in public. And with that regard, we've got some uh, guests with us today. So first of all, Sophie and Jodry from uh, Elysium Healthcare are joining us. Uh, Ron Mendel, I can't see Ron yet, but he's a regular attender as a member of the public. Um, William Hensler, who's on the graduate management scheme at uh, BT Blood and uh, sorry NHS Blood and Transplant. Um, Louisa Daly from NHS Business Service Authority, and Matt Discombe from the Health Service Journal uh, are all with us this afternoon as well. So welcome. Uh, I hope you enjoy the meeting. There's a fair bit for us to go through. We've had a busy morning, and I think we're going to have a busy afternoon as well. I've got a few apologies, but not too many. Uh, Rosie Shepherd, Joe Walker, John Martin, Joe Hicks and Mark Cook, but Richard is representing Mark, uh, John Hayes and then uh, Ruth has indicated she's got to go a little bit early and I think Maria you have as well. Um, any other apologies other than those I've just mentioned? No? Okay, thanks very much. So declarations of interest, obviously we've recorded all of those uh, for meetings up until now. Is there anything anyone needs to declare that they haven't declared for the purpose of this meeting? No? Okay. Um, so we have the uh, minutes of the meeting of the 5th of September have been circulated to you. Is anybody like to raise any points on there or uh, any factual inaccuracies? No? Okay, thank you. I don't think we had any actions arising from that last meeting that haven't been dealt with. Um, so unless anybody's got any points I want to make around actions from the last meeting. No, OK, I'll pass over to Shane then for the CEO update report. Shane. Thank you, Chair. And as always, the three big things at the moment. Uh, I'm not going through the report in detail, clearly you've had it in advance, but I just want to highlight the three important things I've seen certainly by me at the moment in terms of what's happening in the system and the region and in the country. Uh, the first one obviously is the independent report on NHS in England, the Lord Darcy report. Um, and what I've tried to do is just to summarise some of the key issues that have come out of the report. Um, and the more I read it, actually, the more I find other issues that I think I could have brought forward. But what I wanted to share um, is on page da -da 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 four of the report, which is very much about moving forward. Um, <clears throat> I think this comes into our conversation, certainly in terms of Healthy Together 2040, but even some of the conversations and decisions we might make in a tactical way to the longer term strategic way. And the sort of thing that Darcy is suggesting, now quite clearly there will be a 10-year plan. Darcy is one voice into the 10-year plan, not the only voice. There'll be the voice of the public, the voice of our staff, etc. But Darcy is a very strong voice into that plan. And the kind of things that I think we should expect to build into our plans are the likes of the redirection of financial flows. You know, we've got a shift from community to acute to community. The sort of thing we have to really get around is the whole idea of analog to digital. And there's a lot of, lot of discussion in the paper around that. And quite clearly, we're talking about a digital strategy as well. From delivery to prevention, and again, healthier 2040, exactly where it needs to be. Lots in the report about productivity and how we improve productivity. And I think what was striking for me, you know, we talk about revenue being flat or decreasing. We talk about capital over the last number of years being in really short supply. We've more staff than ever working buildings that are not as fit as they should be for purpose with technology that is not as enabling. So you're never going to have the level of productivity if you don't increase the money, increase the people alongside the capital. And, and that's a challenge I think the report calls out very clearly. It also calls out about being 100 percent true about accountabilities, lines of responsibility, NHS, ICB, trust, etc. Um, and then I think the big thing that struck me in the report is the opportunity we have to improve the health of the nation and the prosperity of the nation. The NHS is an enabler for pr prosperity, for um, enabling people to continue to work, to return to work, etc. So I've tried to summarise certainly those last six points, the things that are in my mind floating around how do we build that into our tactical plans this year, but how do we build it into Healthy Go 2040 and actually even further on than that. Then taking the next big thing for me, which is slightly less strategic and more tactical, is the winter priority. So I shared with you um, in terms of the middle of September, 16th of September, uh, NHSE, 
issued to all chief executives of trusts and ICBs um, the winter priorities letter and the priority and the letter of priorities for the remainder of the year as well. I've included in there the key issues from that letter because that drives what the executive team and our partners now need to get on with. Um, I think it is important that I've called out specifically in my report the responsibilities of the ICB. There are responsibilities for providers, there are responsibilities for NHSE, but I've called out specific ones for us. And for us, it's very much about having a solid winter plan and being the coordinator of that plan. And it is really important in November, we'll be bringing the winter plan to the board to allow the board to scrutinise what we're trying to do over winter. But I think it is really important that we appreciate that the ICB on this board cannot manage every element of winter. Other partners have their own boards, their own chief executives, their own accountability. They need to deliver that. And I've called out in the letter what we are responsible for as an ICB. And it's very important that we, we don't tread on everyone's toes. We do what we're meant to do and allow the organisations who are partners to get on and doing what they need to do. In the final part of my report, I've called out and actually myself and uh, Maria actually were in Exeter yesterday, um, all chief executives from the South West, ICB and provider, were part of a meeting yesterday looking at, well, what is the what is the NHS impact approach with regards to what's being termed as the operational excellence programme? So later on today, we'll explore our overarching approach to tran transformation, innovation and improvement. Yesterday was very much about what you might call the operational improvement side of the house. And it looked at some recent uh, launch of guidelines and, and what are called LIMS, which is local improvement networks, to say there are four big things that NHSE are suggesting, and, and we would agree, that we need to get on the improvement journey with. You can see them in my paper. It's about our urgent emergency care flow, um, elective care, outpatients, and then medical consulting uh, job planning. And we explored those yesterday in terms of well, what does that mean for each of us, whether it's a provider or an ICB or system or a region. And these are going to become really important this year. These are toolkits or the kind of things that a good system and organisation should be doing. We have a lot of work to do to implement a continuous improvement culture, methodology, etc. OK, and that needs to be done alongside it. But it's important these guidelines have been produced and we have to, as a system, work out how best to implement those as improvement guidelines. So, Chair, I'm very happy, as always, to take thoughts, comments on questions. But for me, it's been three big things in the last four weeks that actually really shape our strategic thinking and also some of our tactical thinking for this year. OK, thanks, Shane. Uh, a lot in there and a lot in the report as well. But any comments or questions? Uh, Alison. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Thank, thanks, Shane. Uh, as always, I always find it useful what's in your head um, that you want to share at board. Um, two quick questions. One is, um, there's been a lot in the press recently about vaccination rates going down. I know historically we've done quite well in our patch, but I wondered what we were going to do to make sure that we um, encouraged as many people who who would benefit from the vaccine to have it. And I think if I remember that. I think in a, some of our partner institutions last year, the, the, the vaccination rates for flu, for example, went down in some of the providers as well. So I know we've historically done well, but it feels like nationally it's gone down a bit. So what are we doing to make sure it goes up? And then I was interested in the letter from NHS um, England for the, winter, for the winter. And I was just looking at the specific asks and I just wondered if anything was a surprise there um, and does it would it indicate I know you're bringing back a, a report in November to board but it the, the asks look asks that we'll be familiar with so it was I didn't know if there was anything different or new that we thought as a result of the letter we would be focusing in an area that we haven't previously focused on. Yeah thank you Alison so I'll start with the latter one um, <clears throat> no there isn't anything particularly new and, and an NHSC were clear with us when they shared their thinking with us at a meeting a few uh, a few months ago that they didn't intend to introduce anything wildly new the aim was get the value out the stuff you're putting on the ground and really start to get benefit from it so the 10 key high impact actions for example haven't become 11 you know they've they've stuck with we know, we think we know what we need to do 
Now, the job is to put it in a plan and, and get on with it, Alison, and there's nothing new. And when we look at what we're responsible for in terms of some of the pre-hospital stuff, in terms of having a plan, in terms of governing the 10 high-impact uh, interventions, it's exactly what we thought it would be. And certainly Dave and others are working on that uh, as the basis of the plan. With regards to vaccination, I'll defer to some of my colleagues directly on that, actually, Alison, because uh, we are you are correct from a population perspective and also from an employee perspective, we have been quite good. I know that certainly in Joe's world, so Joe's, certainly in Joe's world and in Ruth's world, there's a lot of work going on to make sure we drive that. But I think Ruth and Joe are probably the better person to answer than me. So. I can talk less about um, employee vaccination rates, but just in terms of our local approach to vaccination, we have good rates locally, not as well, as high as we would want them to be, and we're certainly not relaxed about it. We've got um, a strategic, strategic immunisations oversight group that works really hard as with system partners to improve uptake. Uh, there's a big focus on MMR, as I'm sure you could imagine, over the past year, and we've just had some really good evaluation back on that. So just dug out the, the stats. So for, um, for for babies in MMR, we had the fourth best uh, increase in England in our ICB, fourth best increase. And for those between 12 and 25, we had the best ICB percentage increase in England as a result of this cross-system work. So we're not relaxed about it. There's a lot of focus on it, um, and, but we do work best when we work with our communities and, and as a whole system. So there, there's reason to be hopeful. I think Ruth said most of the things that I was about to say, Alison. <laughs> so Geeta, my deputy, um, chairs the Immunisation and Vaccination Group. MBT are currently holding the contract. It will be re-procured next year. But I was going to mention the fact that we were the fourth most improved ICB on the MMR uptake, and the two were at the top had had national additional funding. We did it within current resource envelopes. So I was really pleased that we've managed to be in that top cohort of ICBs but without any additional national funding. I think it was Manchester and London, it was the big cities that got the um, the additional national funding but we did that with our current infrastructure which has been built off all the Covid learning um, and I said I think I am confident that that infrastructure allows us to look at the populations that need it, we can look at workforce numbers, they're vigilant, it's a partnership organisation between all the key partners so it's a good infrastructure that has, I think has got actually been quite mature now in its establishment and that's how flu and covid vaccinations will be managed this year yet again hey thanks Jen. uh jen thanks chair and just uh just from a practical level um alison in terms of the communications and engagement we are um we're working collectively we're doing some very tailored some videos and social media uh marketing aspects to to get out to our hard to reach communities, but also working across our staff groups as well to to encourage them to to take the vaccine up. So it is a key it's a key pillar of our winter cons plan. Hey, thanks, Jen. Um, any other questions for Shane on his update? So as I said, a lot in there, Shane, and it demonstrates a lot of the the good work that's ongoing and the the, the progress we're making. So thank you, well done. If there is no other questions. I'll move us on to the next item, which is Healthier Together 2014, Sarah. I think um, before I get started, um, Dave Perry, who's the chair of the steering group for Healthier Together 2040. Dave, did you want to just say something by way of introduction and then I'll get on? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. That's really good. And um, it's great to have this bit of work in front of the board at the moment, given timing. And I think it's probably one of the most exciting bits of work that we've got going on uh, across the system because it really does start to get into the heart of what I think ICBs and ICSs were actually created to do, which is to start looking at those future models of integration um, going forward. And to to quote um, Steve earlier about building a better platform for the, for the future, really. Um, so this piece of work is really about recognising that when we look forward, um, 2040 and beyond, we probably recognise the, the services that we'll need in place and to provide when matched against the resources that are going to be available to us. The changing demographic demographics in their widest sense really aren't going to meet that need and therefore we need to look at different models of, of, of delivery going forward. Um, and that will cut across the whole system, really, and making some of those shifts. And as uh, Shane mentioned, 
earlier, this really does start to play into some of those local and national priorities that are being um, set out around about recognising, you know, the need to move towards more uh, digitalisation, uh, move towards community prevention, uh, the focus around those wider determinants of health and the way that we deploy our infrastructure um, in that sense. Um, and whilst recognising this clearly needs to be a system led approach, I think it's also important to recognise that delivery in the end is probably going to be through place and places. And therefore, there may be different delivery models that are going to be required in different places. So linkages across into uh, things like the uh, locality partnerships are going to be really important in that space. Um, so as you can see from the paper, we've started uh, that journey. We've started it predominantly at population um, level and looking at priority uh, cohorts. And Sarah will take you through um, some of that work in a little bit more uh, detail. But we've had a significant amount of work done in respect of looking at the evidence base that backs this up, as well as working with partners. Um, and we had a really successful conference actually earlier in the year that was um, oversubscribed and had a waiting list and was really uh, positive. Um, in nature. So we really do now need to get on and start delivering against this. Uh, you'll see um, that there's uh, four priority cohorts that we've uh, developed. Each of those have got a really strong business case sitting around them. So you can make strong arguments for all of them. But ultimately, I don't think we've got the resources to kick them all off at the same time. So we've had to prioritise one of those. Um, and you'll see the report uh, makes recommendations in respect to that. Um, but ultimately, I think this is going to become one of those vehicles that if we can get it right, is going to be really important in respect to delivering against the vision and the ICS strategy that we've set out into the um, longer term. Um, so I'll, I'll finish there, um, Sarah, but just uh, by way of personal thanks to you, Gemma, the ICB team and the steering group as well that have put a lot of work and effort into this so far. Thanks, Dave. And um, so I'll... I'll just take us through a few of the sort of key points from the report, uh, building on what Dave's already updated. So um, oh, let me see if I can. Right. So, yeah, so I think we've sort of covered quite a lot of this. You'll remember that we brought this um, to the board uh, about six months ago, really setting out that the purpose of Healthier Together 2040 is to really um, have that long term strategic plan to address those key challenges that we're facing um, and to deliver the strategy. Um, so really a key bit is addressing that understanding, first of all, the demand changes and then redesigning services to make sure that we're able to respond to that, uh, particularly with a focus on really getting clear about um, what we mean by integrated approaches and really developing that further. With, this is very much in that um, horizon three, in our three horizons model. So taking this sort of over a 15 year timeline and uh, providing alignment and really getting to that clear shared purpose for our partnership. So, I mean, this is, Shane's already mentioned the DARSI report that again reinforces it, but it's not the only thing. We've done a huge evidence review, both of the national evidence and uh, local uh, evidence, and all of it aligns. One of the key issues looking to 2040 is the projected increase in multimorbidity. So people living with multiple health conditions. And we can see there that sort of 37% increase in people living with major illness, which is three and a half times greater than the working age population. So both in terms of, you know, the ability of the country economically to provide that, the resources to cope with that, but also the people to be able to deliver that sort of care. So it requires us to have a really different approach and um, to, to do everything we can to sort of delay um, the onset of those major illnesses and improve healthy life expectancy. So the approach that we've taken is really understanding using our um, local data alongside all of that national evidence um, to really identify the, the sort of key cohorts within that sort of population and taking a real population approach to this. The people that we're identifying in those populations are very much the tip of the iceberg. We know that um, there'll be other 
cohorts of population that will enter those groups as we go forward. And these are often people that are currently experiencing poor outcomes, but often at high cost for services. So because of the, the fact that we're not um, meeting their needs as effectively as we could be. So what we want to do is really move on to focus much more in depth with those populations. And that's a really core part of this work is how we uh, work with those people to understand how we can better meet their needs. So just to be clear, so those when we talk about these cohorts, we've got three um, adult cohorts that represent the tips of those three icebergs. This is um, so that's adults with multiple health needs and disadvantage. So that's people that tend to be um, experiencing uh, disadvantage. So with um, drug or alcohol use, learning disability, mental health needs, often with unstable housing um, and, and that sort of uh, issue. Then we've got people living with multiple long term conditions and they're often people that are also trying to um, they're also working. They're also often carers themselves. Um, so there's a, a cohort in there um, and they're tending to um, get these multiple needs at an earlier age um, and tend to be living in more deprived areas and disproportionately women. And then we've got older people living with multiple long term conditions. There are significant cohorts of people, though, that are at risk of joining these groups in the next 15 years. Uh, the dynamic population model that we have reviewed in board seminar um, sort of demonstrates that. We've then um, identified children as uh, and young people as a fourth um, population cohort. This is more challenging in some ways because our current analysis of that population, we don't have a a way of segmenting the population of children. There's about um, 200,000 children in VNSSG. And um, without a way, so we are working now on trying to get to a better way of segmenting that because you can't, you know, we need to be able to do that sort of in-depth work with the particular segments of the population. So that's work that's ongoing at the moment. So with that in mind, what we're recommending to you today is that we, um, now move on to the next level of in-depth work, working with those populations, focusing first, and it is first, so all of these cohorts are important, but as Dave says, we won't have the resource to do all of them at the same time, but working first on this, people living with multiple long-term conditions. So the rationale for that recommendation is um, because it, it, it really enables us to identify and embed the way up this way of working to prevent future frail populations. So this is our working age group, but obviously in the next using this population, they'll be the ones that over the next 15 years would tip into that frail population and therefore getting a better approach to this may help delay that. Um, we know that these um, the issues that are faced uh, by this population cohort will straddle families, communities, um, housing, um, employment and health. So it, it is going to be a really important bit of this in terms of how we take those sort of really integrated community based approaches. Um, and there will be other knock on benefits from doing that. Um, it is one of those key issues for 2040. So um, it feels like it's an important one to take forward. Um, and we know that there are um, you know, we've already looked this morning at our infrastructure strategy. Um, this also allows us to link into some of those issues um, while we're thinking about the housing growth that will happen over the next uh, 10 to 15 years as well. Um, this isn't a huge cohort of people at the moment in the tip of that iceberg. Obviously, it's going to be a significantly growing proportion. But it, it means it's a sort of manageable one to test out the methodology and to really be able to get into working with those different communities. Um, and we don't actually at the moment have that many uh, existing programmes of work. So it feels like an, it's an important one to get going on. Um, so the idea is that what we would then do over the next sort of six months or so is basically um, work through with this 
target cohort to um, really work through optimising the care for this cohort and improving their wellbeing, identifying opportunities to release capacity, um, and then um, taking actions to prevent future waves um, coming into this cohort and predicting future needs so that we can plan accordingly. So that's really the, the sort of goals for this piece of work. So the next sort of steps are really over the next couple of months doing this deeper work with people. So at the moment, we've got all of this from data. What we need now is to have those conversations with these populations to get greater insights, um, to do the sort of more focused evidence review of best practice from elsewhere, and then start mapping out um, current service use and infrastructure so we can identify where there are those uh, most significant challenges. Taking all of that then into a series of workshops using the Three Horizons model to um, get to a leadership team around this cohort, um, having that sort of large scale involvement at system and as Dave says at place level, because this will be different in different places. Um, so almost you take this cohort, this population cohort that we've already identified, and we will go deeper in um, in looking at the, the differences within that cohort as well. So segmenting it further to understand uh, more in depth. And the idea being that at the end of those workshops that we have a set of medium and long term strategic intentions for the cohort and that wider at risk population um, and a set of goals and outcome measures that we would expect to be tracking then to uh, show the impact of the work that we've done. And so by sort of coming back in spring uh, with those strategic intentions for the board to sign off and then setting up the transition. We've got next um, Debs's paper on uh, the NHS impact um, sort of so that it would transition very much into that space at that point. So that's really the main things I wanted to draw out. The recommendation is um, to for the board to approve us moving on to the next phase of work uh, using this population. Like we say, all of those populations are important and the, um, the ambition is to uh, do the same sort of methodology on all of them. It's really the point at this point is just starting to um, with this population first to really test the methodology um, and then take it forward. So I'm really happy to um, take any questions. Gemma's also with us, who's been um, leading this work with me. And um, we're happy to take any further questions on the paper. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I'll, I'll, I'll open up for questions now. It's probably worth saying that Gemma presented this to the Integrated Care Partnership last week, and they were very supportive of the, the approach and also supportive of the prioritisation. So uh, that, that was there with it. But uh, let me go to questions then. John first. Great. Thank, um, <clears throat> thanks, Chair. And thanks, Sarah. It's a, it's a huge piece of work and it's... Um, it's really impressive to see it coming together. I understand the thinking behind the the, the, the selection of the size of cohorts, and clearly we need we need to we need to start somewhere. I suppose what I'm interested in is how long do you reckon before we can start to kind of get a sense of the genuine impact and to to, to draw meaningful conclusions, so that we can start to think about how we would apply that to um to the larger cohorts. And it would just be helpful to kind of understand and you're thinking if we're going to have to scale up to, you know, kind of in some cases 10, in some cases, you know, up to 100 times the size of this this cohort, your confidence about the ability to to scale up and where that is in the kind of in the thinking and the planning. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so I suppose in terms of just this is very much in that, like I say, this is in that sort of third horizon piece. What I'm expecting is that by the spring, we'll have a really clear set of strategic intentions that then can start to inform our more medium term planning in terms of those, you know, the actual changes starting to be made. Uh, the expectation would be in the spring that, that you'd hand it over then in terms of that more uh, in-depth um, sort of uh, work in terms of the actual changes that would happen. So you'd move from a sort of set of strategic intentions to the more detailed work in terms of um, the actual impact. So I'm sort of envisaging that this is a 
in terms of starting to see the impact on the ground we're talking in the sort of that's why we've sort of set this out as very much this is in the three to 15 years so there's probably a couple of years of actually doing the work and really starting to get this sort of really clearly laid out and that's when it starts to really have the impact on the ground so Obviously, we continue with the work that we're already doing in terms of things like the joint forward plan, but this is very much to inform the, the iterations in the next year or so of that joint forward plan in terms of things changing on the ground. Does that? It, it does. Thank you. And in, in terms of in, in terms of scaling up, I'm like I'm, I'm conscious that yeah. you know, we need to you know we need to to do this and we need to learn and then to to think. But is that is that featuring in your thinking in, in in the conversations that you've had today? I think certainly what we've what, what we're just what we're trying to do is to sort of this is really different way of thinking about things. And so it is what we're trying to do is not um, not try and go too fast too quickly, because I think what we've got to build and I think that's been the benefit over the last six months is it feels like we're building a bit of a momentum and a movement behind this in terms of getting people's heads into a different space in terms of taking this sort of population cohort approach. Um, it is going to require some really different structural thinking as well, and that's why we wanted to um, use this cohort really to test those elements um, but how that then ties back in and knits into things like the medium term financial plan and those sorts of things is going to be critical so um, John I don't know if I'm particularly answering the question well because I think almost we're needing to test this this first cohort before we go a huge amount further with that. Hey, thanks John thanks Sarah. Uh, Maria? Uh, I would absolutely agree um, uh, with the, the cohort chosen, uh, you know, the well-documented increase in chronicity, multimorbidity, and then, of course, the disproportionate influence impact on patient, family, carers, their inability to contribute, and, and obviously the, the cost of services around that. Um, I, I suppose, you know, you, you've mentioned uh, there will be response to DARSI diagnostic, there will be the prescription, uh, which will be the 10 year plan. So obviously, we'll need to kind of make sure we are iterating in line with that. But I don't think we, we can endlessly wait for things. Uh, spending review, um, if we're looking over the time frame we're talking about, um, let us hope that future spending reviews and 10 year plans come with some degree of understanding what the likely envelopes are going to be. I suppose it's back to the design principles. And I know we touched on some of this this morning, um, but whether we're looking at, uh, you know, what is fixed, what will we change? Uh, I think this cohort in particular is a real opportunity to look at how we reshape services outside big acute environments. This is fantastic to really put all our effort and stuff into. Um, so I'm I'm very supportive, but I think there's a, a massive opportunity for reconfiguration around this. Yeah, thanks, Maria. And uh, Sarah, that does touch on the conversation this morning, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And and I think, uh, Maria, the other bit I'd want to add. So I think there's like there's two opportunities. So with the 10 year plan, I think there's both we are going to have to keep live to that, obviously, but I think there's also a real opportunity because of the work we've already done getting to this point. There's an opportunity for us to be influencing some of that as well. So I think we we should take those opportunities. The other bit I just wanted to say is you're absolutely right. This is going to be very much about um, a sort of community based approach. I think we have to be real about this being about pulling services out of the acute sector as well. So I don't I, I want you to feel that that is a really core component to this because we know at the moment we've got people with these multiple conditions that are often having their care um, managed in a sort of maybe not as coordinated as well, a way as they could do and often that means multiple visits to acute hospitals as well so it's it's how we can try and do that differently. Thanks Sarah. Um, Alison? Yeah, really welcome this, totally support it. And um, you have to start with a cohort. This seems a really good cohort. Um, I think a couple of uh, observations on outcomes. And I know 
the outcomes framework is mentioned in next steps. I, I'm hoping for the next phase, outcomes become much bigger because and it's not just outcomes that we think in health. I think we need to be quite open to not making assumptions about what a good outcome is for somebody. And I think we need to hear what they think is a good outcome for them. Um, so there's definitely something about, um, about outcomes. I think we have to be really clear this isn't an initiative. And if we're, if we're starting on this, this is what we're doing. And I was interested in your risk, one of your risk implications, Sarah, which said we will need to reduce other activities and we will have to align resources. And I, I think you've sort of said, but I'm not quite clear at what point, because that's what that's what ICBs are for, is for difficult decisions as well as uh, good, <laughs> easy decisions. But um, just some sense of when we get to that point so so two two comments one on outcomes don't make assumptions and secondly when will we get to that point of uh making some difficult decisions okay so i think Alison, just if i take the second point first in terms of the difficult decisions i think that'll be one of those things where it's it's like almost a live um decision making so i think you know and i Dave and I met with Richard Smale yesterday to talk about how we work with NHS England. And some of this is about being real about if we are we are doing this, this isn't an initiative. This is how we are taking an approach about our population and what's important for BNSSG. That will mean that there will be times where NHS England ask us to do things where with a strong evidence base, we'll go back and say, no, we're focused on this. And that's why. And that's what I mean about us taking this opportunity as well to shape some of the stuff in the 10-year plan because of taking this approach so I don't I'm not thinking it's so there may be points at which we do have to come back to the board and say actually to make sure we've got that backing and um, that we're, we're doing that but I think it is also more dynamic than that and it is um, constantly having you know keeping this as our sort of way of operating and making other decisions against it um, in terms of the outcomes, yes, that is going to be a really important part of this next phase, because obviously the big um, outcome that we're trying to achieve is increasing that healthy life expectancy and particularly trying to, re to narrow the gap in that healthy life expectancy. But it will need to be much more in depth than that. And that's what this next phase of work will um, draw out. Hey, thank, thanks, Work, Sarah. Working with and um, definitely working with those communities. That is a really that I can't emphasize enough. That's a really important part of this next phase. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Ellen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Dave and Sarah, can I just thank you for the, the papers? Um, excellent piece of work. And I just echo sort of uh, the thoughts of others. Um, this point probably is relevant to Deb's paper as well. Um, we had a very interesting conversation earlier about um, flow, uh, which very much links into this whole um, conversation. Uh, we talked about uh, finding a sustainable solution. Um, I fully agree with your rationale for looking at the cohort of people that you've got. My question is, um, we described this morning a piece of work that is quite robust and significant to, to um, challenge that sustainable approach, but it's focused on the over 75s and frailty. So my question is, how could we um, possibly use this piece of work to include that those concerns as well? So the question is, is there the, the capacity to do both? Or do we somehow need to bring that issue in, into this whole piece of work, if that makes sense? I, I do understand what you're saying, Ellen. I think that um, the challenge we have is that we, we think that there really isn't capacity to do both at the same time. And also because we're testing a new way of doing it, we we feel it is important to, to take one first. I, I guess the this is why I've been really emphasising that this is in Horizon 3 and some of what we've had the discussion about this morning is, is very much in the here and now and in Horizon 2 and we're not suggesting that we stop any of that work. So there is a lot of work already going on in that frailty cohort that's in sort of Horizons 1 and 2. We're not, we're not suggesting that we stop that work. What we're saying is we start now with this cohort, which will hopefully prevent, for, you know, delay people 
moving into that sort of frailty cohort, which we can see in some of our populations is is at quite a young age, we've got people moving into that cohort. So hopefully it starts to make a shift in terms of um, that future movement, because over this time horizon, these people will become the next cohort of the frail elderly. So it helps uh, with that. But at the same time, it develops our learning so that we can then come back with that much bigger cohort, having tested the methodology and, and then move on to that cohort. So it's not that it's not a priority, it's just the timing and making sure that we've um, given ourselves opportunity of testing how we work with these different populations. Can I, can, sorry, can I just come back quickly, Jeff? Um, I just wonder if perhaps, Deb, when you get to your paper later, whether you, you heard the conversation this morning, and we're also talking about this now, um, from your expertise in terms of transformation, because I think what we described this morning has got an element of transformation in there. Is, the, is there the capacity within the ICB to do both? And, and do they cross over a little bit? But, but I'd just like to hear your, your views later when, you, when you're talking about your paper. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. So can I take uh, Richard and then Hugh and then I'll I'll draw this item to a close if I can. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Sarah, really not great paper. And I think we're really pleased to see the sort of data informed reflection on the population driving driving the change process. A couple of quick points from me. You reference in there the desire to influence the national agenda. And you also reference the sort of payment options and the linked data challenges and all of that. So if there's any support we can give you from an NHSE perspective around any of that, let us know. Really keen to work with you and support you. The other point I was going to make, but Maria largely addressed it, was the link to the acute strategy. But I think Maria made clear how, how strong that link needs to be in this piece of work. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, Hugh. Thank you. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, yeah, you know, we welcome this. This is great. Um, uh, I would latch on to Ellen's kind of point in regard to the need to concurrently um, address different issues at once, especially as the urgency of the older people's challenge is huge. Um, maybe that's more of a short term piece of work that we can address whilst this is in long form. I'd like to say also uh, the data driven kind of objective perspective that we're getting is very insight, insightful, but I fully welcome the idea that it becomes much more co-productively informed through um, engagement with people with lived expertise. Um, just from my perspective, I'd like to see how that is informed in the context of some of the starkest areas of health inequality, specifically for, you know, as we discussed earlier today, in regard to uh, people from minoritised uh, ethnic backgrounds. Uh, but also to do with poverty and to do with deprivation, because there'll be very great differences amongst the population in regard to some of those people with some of those characteristics. But this is all good and looking forward to moving forward with some of it. Uh, th thanks, Hugh. And perhaps some of those items on health inequality, Joanne, we can pick up at the, the new uh, health inequality committee that we're about to establish, because that, that will link into that. I, th I think, Sarah, the challenge is going to be, isn't it? This is a great piece of work. I think everyone's welcoming it. It shows that we're thinking very strategically about what we're going to do. It's as we get closer, the here and now often swallows up the, the greater intent, doesn't it? And we just, as a board, I think we need to keep our eye on that, don't we? That we don't sort of slip into, well, but that's what we intended to do, but we never had the, the space to do it. So uh, great piece of work. It, what we're being asked to do today as a board is to... Uh, approve the recommendations to progress on to the next steps uh, and to note the uh, other population cohorts that will be taken forward after this in initial prioritisation. So is there anybody who's not happy to support that recommendation? No? OK, great. Thank you very much. So, Deb, on to you then. Developing BNSSG's tr uh, transformation, improvement and innovation capabilities. Thanks, Jeff. And hopefully, Alan, we will answer your questions as we go through. But if you don't feel we have, I'm sure you'll pick it up at the end. Um, so in terms of um, in recognition of the importance of improvement, of change and transformation and our role as an ICB board on behalf of our system, we had the mandate back in May, um, which we, we agreed the five principles around improvement that we'll see on a set of slides, which I hope will be coming up in a moment. Um, perfect. Thank you, Kate. Um, so in terms of the mandate, it was about how do we start to drive the approach 
connected to those principles. So that's as a board, when Helen and I came along, you asked us to make sure we go away and think about how would this work. It was also about in recognition of how do we do this Horizon 2 piece, which is how we actually move ourselves from where we are now into the future. And you know, Sarah's points about the Horizon 3 are really helpful because if we've got Horizon 2 plus, it's how do we do improvement in service of that future state? And we also talk about Horizon 2 minus, which is in service of supporting our existing and current state. And we kind of need to do both but it's about how we balance that. And uh, you'll see in the paper, there are some hypotheses that said we actually do spend a, a lot of our time focusing on Horizon 1, and we don't give enough to the Horizon 3 element. Um, the other piece of the mandate was making sure that we have a system-wide approach to transformation. Um, and I think on behalf of the improvement community who've been co-producing this with me, we are really grateful that as a board, we're recognising the importance of this work. Um, and it was it was really put into a few words by Amanda Pritchard at her address at the Improvement Conference a couple of weeks ago, where she said boards need to be on board with improvement. This is critical. So um, it's really great that we are having this conversation today. Um, we've been working across the system, collecting wisdom both um, from our local teams, but nationally and internationally. Um, and we've had quite a robust process over the past few months and it's been co-produced. We started with a diagnostic, which is in line with our principles to understand in detail what actually gets in the way of us being successful at transformation. So what you've got in the in the paper is all of the insight and detail. There's quite a lot of it. So a lot of it's in the appendices, but we've we've collated this through a process of synergy mapping and design, and they've formed into a series of 12 components um, that we'll talk about in a second that form our transformation framework. And this draws in the work that we've been doing around innovation um, and innovation in partnership with um, our local health improvement network, health innovation network. Um, so today we are asking for your support and the mandate for us to start to deliver this proposed 12 point plan in service of a key area of improvement to test and ensure that we've actually got this right. And that could be the Healthier to Web of 2040, as Sarah's talked about, um, and picking up at that implementation um, stage, or there could be another area of strategic transformation that we need to focus on first. So I am uh, very fortunate to be joined by some of our expert transformation leaders across the system who are gonna be flagging up their lens on the core elements of where we need to start and why not just my voice, but why they believe this is a, such an important step for us to take. So I'm going to hand now to um, to Helen Gilbert and Helen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Helen Gilbert. I'm the Director of Improvement at North Bristol Hospitals Trust. And so um, the element of the paper I'm going to talk to is, is our ambition around starting with a leadership compact or leadership agreement for the system leadership predicated around the principle of starting well and also talking to this is really about developing what that future vision for Horizon 3 looks like and how we'll translate it into a delivery plan back into our respective organisations. Um, in terms of the spirit of our definitions that we've highlighted to you around improvement, continuous improvement, transformation, innovation, we often use these things in interchangeably, um, which, by the way, are not mutually exclusive. But this paper's ambition is highly likely, we believe, to result in a significant amount of innovation and transformation in the, in, in the spirit of our definitions. And so our genuine motivation and drive is that we want to be population driven and organised organisation enabled. And by nature of that, we don't know today what that future is going to look like, but we respect all of our um, individual talent um, and that the collective sum of it is far greater than the uh, the individual component parts. So we're, re we're also recommending the compact as an excellent way to mitigate against um, a number of the barriers that we identified to delivering transformation really well, which you'll find in Appendix uh, 2, I think it is. Um, and so what are we asking up front here? Let's have an open and honest, transparent discussion at the very beginning of this before we start about where we're likely to face significant challenges um, and where we have amazing opportunities, both collectively and independently as organisations. And then let's agree what we'll do um, and more like uh, let's agree what we will do um, 
when we actually come up and face those things on our journey now before we start. So what are we expecting to create a sensible and practical system leadership agreement or compact with some healthy challenge in there about about the future and our accountability mechanisms and essentially create the guardrails around our work to protect it for the future? And what do we need to do now? Recognise and agree that it represents a really healthy way to embark on this journey and agree it's important to take the time out to do it. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. And um, the slide that you've got in front of you is our collation of the overarching 12 steps in our plan. Helen's talked about the, the one and two, which I think are really important for us as a board and for some of the leadership conversations that we had earlier today. The second area is about establishing a transformation academy, which encompasses a number of elements that we already have in train today. So, for example, the Healthier Together Fellowship, bringing that together and anchoring it in a space that people understand how to connect, but also where to get expert advice from. And this was an area that all of our transformation leaders felt that they could both contribute to and benefit from right across the organisation. So it's an area of learning and evaluation. Then in terms of the focused priorities and making sure that we really have some central tenants, and I think they reflect really well into the presentation that Sarah's just given around making sure that we've got benefits, benefits realisation at the heart of what we're doing. So we're clear that we can track benefits and we design for benefits realisation from the outset and then prioritising that user centred design. So it is absolutely central to the way in which we shape design and think about services. And then having an oversight capability so that we understand what we're doing, how we're doing it and whether we have the resource. So, well, and this kind of starts to answer your question, but also really importantly, one of the things that came up in the board conversation in May was that we have a high level overview of what the transformation load is on our system. So we can really start to track that and make our decisions about what we can and can't do with fuller information than we have today so that we are actually sharing that across um, system partners and getting insights and also then being able to utilise the resource um, across the piece. So I'm now going to hand to Phil Clatworthy. Um, uh, if you could flick the slide on um, to the next slide for us, Kate. Um, oops, they've just come down. Um, thank you. Um, Phil, over to you if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Phil Clark. I'm a stroke consultant at North Bristol and the clinical lead for implementation of the stroke transformation programme, as well as one of the uh, chief clinical informatics officers at, at North Bristol Trust. Um, so, so really, um, I don't know if you can move to the other slide. Um, the, um, there, there are some really important lessons from the stroke transformation, which I wanted to talk about that we need to give, give ourselves the space to learn. I think sometimes um, we, you know, we, we've got so much to do that we don't always um, ha have the opportunity to, to learn from the things that we've done. And um, uh, can you just move on? As, is it one slide forward from from there? Deb, sorry, it's the one that that says the stroke at the top one, of the Kate, slide. The um, slide. And it's really in the context um, of the the principles. Can you go on one further? Um, so. I think we might have an okay. issue, um, Phil. Right. So you you no might worries. need to talk it through while Kate. That's fine. It out. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, so, so it's really about putting some of those things into context with, about the, the principles, really, that also speak very much to those twelve, um, uh, those twelve components. So, when we're talking about starting well, um, it, there's, it, you know, it's re it's very essential. It's something that we did do well in the stroke program, but just a reminder to us that we mustn't forget that we need to make sure that we're thinking about implementation and delivery and then ongoing improvement after that. So to make sure that um, that we're not working to um, to a, you know, a, a single date, but actually we need to be thinking properly around around the fact that these things need to be implemented and delivered. Um, in terms of the uh, what success looks like. It's, it is really that move from um, essentially an, an organisational centric way of doing things to being able to look at value in terms of those I ICS aims and population health outcomes. Um, and, and therefore, 
you know, knowing what we're spending and being able to measure the value of that against those things. Um, making sure that when we're moving to that collaborative space that we're we're re retaining that responsibility and accountability and how those are going to be delivered um, and also um, finance really needs to the, the way finance works needs to change as well so we need to be able to move all money between organizations if that's that if we're looking across the pathway at, at, at value um, and move to a user and population focus um, from the thoughtful design, it, it isn't. It is. It is the design, but there's much more about ongoing relationships with users and some of that health inequalities work. It's it's moving from a from a ask some ask somebody when you want to know something to an ongoing relationship and keeping listening um, to people and and how they're experiencing services. Um, from a digital point of view, there are huge opportunities now from digital and data i've changed that from digital to by default to digital by design because things aren't digital by default you have to design it um, and it really will help us to transform services and move us towards horizon three but only if we embed it at all stages um, and again that's one of the big learning areas from the stroke reconfiguration is that um, it was it was sort of assumed, I guess, that digital would follow the pathway, um, but it's a it's a big piece of work in itself. So it, you need to think about how you design that in to get the best benefit from it. And data really will really help us and did in the stroke program. But we have to aim for that unvarnished truth um, and, and make sure that that's not reinforcing organisational biases. So the same data can say different things and we need it to say what we needed to say from a population person perspective and not an organizational perspective the intelligence center which is being developed in terms of a centralized data sharing and um, and uh, data uh, repository i guess is going to really help us with that if organizations engage with it um, and then just really reinforcing the the vital importance of what helen was saying at the beginning around you know it, it's these things are big and there is a lot of culture change involved um, and there will, you know, people need to have trust and respect and those values and behaviours um, to support us on that journey because it is a it is a big a big thing. Um, and so with stroke, you know, there are a lot of successes, but it really has highlighted some ongoing challenges that we can address um, if we if we give ourselves the space to learn. And then finally, I think Paul Flood is with us from a local authority perspective, just to make sure. Paul, are you with us? Can't I see am. you on the screen. Ah, oh, perfect. There we go. Deborah, hi, and yeah, thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be brief about this. I mean, the, the, you know, Bristol has been part of the, the, uh, uh, I guess, consultation and development, uh, uh, looking at this framework. And I guess I, I'm here to lend my voice uh, around. We all feel the pressures of the day to day. And I think this 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 framework, the values attached to it, gives us something that moves us beyond reactive to you know it's a difference between um, reacting and responding. Uh, I know from my own space it, it, as a D two A transformation managing and commissioning, uh, it's very difficult to get height and to get height to move us to somewhere where we want to go on a more proactive basis that isn't just about responding to you know h1 trying to keep the show on the road so it's really deborah just you know, lending my voice there to say that i i think this is a helpful useful framework um partnerships work uh, partnership working is hard um if it was easy we'd have all done it constructively uh, coherently many years ago um and we still face significant challenges with this uh, i think this framework um, helps support that around reconciling um, similar but competing demands and priorities. Um, Deborah, I think that's it. Thank you. So, Jeff, that kind of concludes our presentation uh, around the paper. And hopefully, what you've heard is this is a true system piece of work that is supported and has been co produced um, by our system uh, experts and really tries to draw together the wisdom and what we believe we need to do and take action around to be able to make sure that we are more successful around the enormous transformation, change, improvement and innovation agenda we have as a board. Thanks. OK, thanks, Deborah, and thanks to everybody who's, who's contributed to the work so far on the presentation today, because I think it does fill us full of some hope. 
and uh, recognizing that there's some exciting stuff on the horizon uh, that we're moving forward in that sort of collaborative space. But uh, let me open it up to questions or any observations, uh, Shane. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think what's really important about this piece of work is we can accidentally be drawn into technical change. We can accidentally be drawn into, well, here's another piece of guidance implement, or here's, this is going to provide the guide rails actually rather than guidance for the guide rails for us as a system to become involved in adaptive change and hopefully transformation and, and innovation. And we need this because if we don't create this space ourselves, create a way that we're going to work together to do that, we'll get stuck in the, we've used H1, H2, H3 a lot today, but we'll get stuck in the transactional element the, the, of, of change as opposed to this giving us the tools, the capability and the structure to get into true adaptive change and hopefully innovation. So um, producing a paper, really important, but simple. Doing it is, is the point that would become challenging. But we have to do this. So we all sign up to these 12 points of where we're going as a system. Otherwise, from an NHS perspective, we'll just continue to respond to guidance and implement the guidance. This is about us taking control of our own future. Thanks, Shane. Uh, Julie? Um, great paper, Deb, and, you know, really, really supportive of the principle, but I am nervous, and I suppose I'm nervous from a point of view of, one, capacity and resource. I think we've got, all of us have probably got quite limited transformation resource already within individual organisations, um, and also given lots of the other conversations we've been having about the need for complete relook and transformation of the way we do things um how are we going to resource this i think also i'm nervous from just a point of view of when we talk about board development there's a lot we need to do within our organizations we we've done all this and we are sort of getting it but i know when i go back to my board I need to do a lot of work with, you know, particularly non-executive directors around what this means and that natural tension, isn't it, between organisation and system, etc. So um, where are we going to put that sort of effort? And then the third bit is that how genuinely those competing priorities within an organisation where there's massive transformation needed on the ground cultural change to get people um, to change vis-a-vis -vis doing everything as a system and that doesn't mean we don't do it as a system but we start with the organizations coming up so principle I couldn't fault it I'm just a little bit there's something I'm just a bit nervous about the practical reality um, without doing some of that wider groundwork first OK, Deb, before you respond to that, I've got a lot of hands up. So why don't I take all the, the questions from people? Otherwise, we're just not going to get time to get through it. So um, let me take those and then we'll make a summary and you can perhaps come in at the end. So, Dominic, thanks, Julie. Thank you. Mine is a bit of a build on that, but with a slightly different frame. Having recently explored this as an organisation, um, as we look at all the things we want and need to do, um, and uh, the, the, the challenge around bandwidth, really. Um, wh where I think I've landed is, is that, is that uh, given that the, if one accepts that the currency of leadership is attention, so we have finite bandwidth at different points in organizations and in the system, we can't do everything all at once. Um, if we want change to happen, then putting it in the hands of the people who are most able to affect it and most affected by it, is really helpful as a guiding principle. Um, so in my head, and I was thinking of three levels, but actually now I think system, there are perhaps four. The sort of level one, which is around QI in teams, wards, departments, and having a standardized methodology that one can roll out and do at scale, lots and lots of little incremental improvement projects. And you just teach people how to do it and then empower them to do it and they get on with it. And the more we do that, the better. The second for an organization like mine would be, if you like, divisional level, where we say, yep, get on with that. And by the way, here's some tools that might help you, but we kind of don't feel the need to steer it or be heavily involved in it. 
for level three is as a trust, this is really important to us and therefore we are going to engineer it to ensure it delivers uh, and drive it forwards. And then the fourth level would be at system level. This will not happen unless multiple system partners come together and do something similar. So there might be something about how we striate the types of change that we want to do to place them at the right level, which then means that we can look at the balance of resources in different places and say, have we got that balance right? And will, will the sum of those different sets of changes led by different people in accordance or with fidelity to standardised models of uh, change and delivery deliver the, 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 the sum uh, uh, that we want at the end. Um, that might seem very um, motherhood and apple pie, but that's just kind of where my thinking has got to at this point. Thanks, Dominic. We'll pick those up at the end. Uh, Richard. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. The paper, Deb, I thought was great to you and the team. It's got a lot of good stuff in there. I think the emphasis on the cultural side of change here is is really key, and you make that very clear. I love the phrase, no one knows the outcome. You know, this is all a lot about experimentation, trialling and learning, isn't it? And I think the paper is very strong in that regard. A couple of really practical areas. One, um, I think this paper is ahead of what most systems are currently producing. Um, so there's an opportunity, I think, for us to work with you to capture learning as you go on this journey and, and support that. The other one is you talk about the Transformation Academy, you talk about the partners in the system putting resource into it, and Julie's made made the point of that could be a challenge. There's partners beyond the system, so think about us at NHSE if we can support you, but also CSUs and others. Just encourage you to have a sort of broad perspective on that, but overall really support the initiative. Thanks, Richard. Um, Steve. Yeah, thank you. I guess I'm in a similar place to some of the other questions, and that's um, do we have the capability, capacity and resource? And if we do, how are we carving it out to focus on this rather than the million and one other things that people will get sucked into if we're not careful? So do you have a do we have a view of what the resource is and have we identified it and pulled it out? And then have we got some form of governance reporting so we know where we're going with this how it's tracking okay thanks That's steve it. maria um i suppose i'm i'm minded of the um improvement event we were at yesterday some of us um uh with our regional colleagues uh, and I'm a member of uh, NHS Impact, which is the National Improvement Board, where we are looking to deduplicate efforts, to do things once, to look at what works and to adopt and spread very, very quickly so that not everyone has to go away and replicate their own system. Within our system, we have quite a lot of improvement methodology going on, and, and we were very lucky to have support from our system partners to both UHBW and NBT in setting up um, patient first. And thank you very much to Helen for, for doing that so ably at NBT. I suppose I'm, I'm, I would ask the question, is this duplicating something else that is already going on because actually a lot of the constituent organizations have their own transformation improvement methodology um is this suitable for example would universities use this um we've got uh, a, a rich uh but perhaps dizzying array of um, innovation opportunities through Bristol Health Partners, through Health Innovation, um, who do lots of the accelerator model. I'm just saying it's quite a complicated picture out there. And sometimes you can, if we make this difficult to understand, follow, or frankly plan the fun and curiosity and energy out of it, it may not get us the benefits we need. So it, I suppose I wanted to see what is it that can only happen once at system level that that is going to be greater than the sum of the parts that is already going on in each of the organizations i'm very aware we have to look at a a cost neutral or better environment going forward with a focus on productivity um also looking at the learning and innovation networks that have been set up regionally how will this interface with them hey thanks maria and joanne I, was, I, I just wanted to offer up my support for this approach and listening to people's comments. I think one of my um, challenges would be, do you think we're doing innovation and change really well without redundancy and waste at the moment? 
my my diagnostic be but no we're not we do this slowly we sometimes do it poorly we fail we don't notice it and we continue for too long so i think we've got a built-in level of redundancy which is very difficult to quantify but even so again if you ask phil about the stroke program rollout trying to do even teledermatology we are not, we haven't got a unified way of working we're not doing change and innovation quickly we often disagree and we often don't get the outputs we want so i do think we've got redundancy that we can do better more efficiently to answer the duty problem have we got the the bodies the capacity we're also trying to flip the way the power hierarchy works aren't we we're supposed to be giving people who know are experts in their in their field in our in our organizations empower them to make the changes that they believe which is the continuous improvement methodology Debs has brought a group of experts in our in our ICS system together and I think we just need to be careful that we don't undermine their expertise their knowledge their lived knowledge by thinking we know better so I just think we just need to be careful about some of our assumptions we're playing in and I'm trying to live by sort of some of the values we are which is about empowerment going down to the level that have the expertise Dominic, you talked about it, but it applies here too. And I do support the paper and I recognise an awful lot of best practice that Debs has put in it. OK, Deb, I, I don't know whether you captured all of that, but there's there's a lot there's a lot in there. First of all, I, I'm hearing that people are generally supportive, but there's points in there they want to check. So things like both Julie and Steve mentioned the practical realities, you know, capability amongst everything else that's going on. Dominic talked about what we pitch where at the, at the different levels. Uh, Richard talked about the engagement with NHSE and and you know us perhaps exemplaring some of the stuff uh, across the system, um, and then Maria's point about duplication of effort, which is you know how ha what do we need to do at system level that isn't being done elsewhere, and I think finally Joanne's put a uh, uh, point at the end about appealing to us all to. Uh, keep going <laughs> so Deb that was a bit of a brief summary of it but is uh, uh, you may have picked up more than that no I think that was really helpful and if I can respond to some of those hopefully relatively quickly um taking them slightly out of order Dominic's points I think are really important and I think we need to um really highlight that in the paper so that it's really clear I think the um, the points that Julie made about the resourcing, and it kind of links to Maria's points as well. The question we asked in the discovery is, what gets in the way of transformation and our efficient delivery of transformation? And all of these actions are, as Joe, thank you, really helpfully said, it is all of our collective system experts' answers to that question. These are the things that we need to put in place to help us do better transformation, to improve the way that we improve inside organisations and outside. And we've been really careful to step well away from getting into the methodologies of QCIR and patient first and whatever organisations have chosen to use because they've embedded them. This is the stuff that we need to do together to make sure that we learn some of the lessons that Phil very ably kind of flagged up to make it real that we have had happen with major investments in our system. So I think that's really helpful. Richard, definitely take you up on that. Um, that's really important. And I think the bit about understanding our transformation load as a system is really important because one of the things that um, uh, colleagues talked about, and I'll ask um, colleagues to come in in a second, is that we are potentially duplicating effort and energy at the moment, but we just don't know it because we don't share our transformation programs and information together and we really need to step into a space where we can do that and we are doing things and making it difficult for ourselves when we didn't know there was an expert in something else around the corner and um, so it really is about driving efficiency in terms of the costs one of the statements that i think is really helpful in this is one of the statements that i pulled out and is in the appendix is this is not about more money. This is about doing things differently. More money is just a lazy response to transformation. And that was a quote, direct quote from one of the system experts. And I think that that was something we really connected on. So we then felt as we went through and said, well, how are we going to do all of this? To then say, by the way, we need another load of money. We decided that we needed to eat our own medicine and make sure that what we were doing was driving an approach 
that would consider how can we look at what we are doing now and build this through efficiency rather than building it through um, additional investment. Notwithstanding, Richard, we will take any investment you've got at Region um, and we will put it to really good use and share the knowledge and learning. Um, Helen, Phil, Paul, Kate, was there anything else you wanted to add? I know we're slightly over time, Chair. Yeah, but Deb, just we, we, if we open up to everybody to answer, we could well, well be here at half past three. I, I would seize victory from the jaws of, okay. of uh, success while we're at them, because I think you have, have reached that point. And uh, I think there's, there's three key recommendations in the paper, one around the 12-point approach, the second is around the system leadership compact, and the third is around agreeing to pilot. Um, I think Steve's point around updating governance is a good one as well. So just a final question of, I'm, get, I'm getting a sense of support for it, albeit there's some caveats. Um, but that point about, so, so how, where is this updated to? At what frequency? Um, you know, is it into Fed? Is it back to the board? Is it into exec group? You know, where's that happening? Yeah, there isn't a place that looks at this yet. So I think what we'll do is we'll take that away and consider it. But what we are talking about is setting up a governance group around transformation um, that repurposes a group that we already have. So that's the proposal, but that would then feed into probably into system chief executives. But if we take that away as an action, Jeff, and come back and make sure that we and, and, and advise. Deb, you know, I, I think just update, whether it's scrutiny, governance or anything else, but just by way of update, I think this is an agenda item that, that interests people and they will see that you're entering into a space which is changing the way we're working, which dominated the conversation that we had this morning. So, so it's some really, really good stuff. I think people here would like to see how that's developing. So if we can hear right. that coming back, that that would be absolutely great. Is there anything else anybody feels they have to contribute on this item now before I move us on to Deb's next one, which is around the digital strategy update? So thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for joining. Okay. And uh, I think we've got the message to crack on. Thanks. OK, thanks, Deb. OK, digital strategy de deliver delivery quarterly update then, please. And thank you to everyone else who joined us for that item. Uh, so next item, um, we agreed when we signed off in February the digital strategy that we would periodically bring this into um, the board. What we've decided to do today, because the area that had a lot of energy and was also in the DASI review was around the NHS app. And one of the programmes that we have is around the NHS app. So we went through this briefly um, in Fed this week um, uh, and uh, I am joined by Helen and Rhys. Um, from OneCare and the design team. Are you with us, Rhys? Hi, Deb. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Um, to take us through the programme of work. So just to highlight, really important, um, NHS app is the development of uh, a way in which our population can start to engage with the NHS. Um, it is developed centrally. And there are a whole load of expectations on us to um, start to utilise and drive up the utilisation in our population. There is a programme of work in the centre called the Wayfinder programme, which um, is creating ways to be able to build connections so that when you go into the NHS app, there's a whole raft of functionality available to you. So, for example, um, in NBT and UHBW, they have a product called Doctor Doctor. There is now an interface with Doctor Doctor in the NHS app so that I can as a user, I can see my appointments, change my appointments, et cetera, through the NHS app without having to leave it. Um, and there are more and more interfaces that are being developed um, uh, week on week through that national programme. What we really wanted to focus on as a first foundation and remembering that the digital strategy was a foundational piece and we also had investment on the proviso that all investment provided cashable savings. So that was our um, agreement around the digital portfolio for this year. So we were looking at how we could engage our population to switch on one little switch that says we will get um, notifications directly through the app, which would mean that from general practice perspective, they wouldn't need to pay for SMS messages, which can add up to quite a significant amount of money. It's not quite a million pounds in our system, but it's not far off. And if you added in what happens in the acute, we would be spending a six digit figure on SMS messages. Um, by doing this in the NHS app, it reduces not just initially, but over time, our ability to do that. So, Reese, I was going to ask you if you want to, um, if we could share the slides 
and if you wanted to take us through the program. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Deb, and thank you everyone for your um, time this afternoon. So I'm Rhys Lewis, I'm Executive Director for Digital and Business Intelligence and have been working uh, closely with uh, Debs and uh, various colleagues uh, within um, her team uh, on this uh, piece of work to date. So uh, I'll try and run you through the uh, the slides that were circulated um, uh, and talk 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 through them. But uh, um, come in if as and when Debs as well. Reece, so, we, we probably only just to say we probably don't have enough time for all the slides. So it's probably just three or four, and then open to questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me pick out some key ones and Debs. Let's. You've done the introduction, really, Debs, about what the uh, what yeah. the what the what the NHS app is. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight then, as well as the kind of as well as the, the cash releasing element of the NHS app, it's also about the expected benefits um, in kind of efficiency for our uh, staff and for the patients uh, for our patients. So. One of the key advantages of the NHS app is its ability to, to improve the efficiency for staff while en enhancing the patient experience. So it reduces time spent on administrative tasks, certainly within general practice, we've, we know and have seen this. So for example, um, requests for repeat prescriptions can be made through the NHS app and normally that's a, an administrative task that takes quite a bit of time in practice. Similarly, practices get a lot of inquiries about outpatient appointments in the acutes, for example, or test results and other uh, other information that's contained within the kind of the GP health record. And because that's all hosted and held within the NHS app, that, that workload is taken away from the practice. Uh, and and that, that's GP clinical time and uh, administrative time. So we're doing some work um, to, to capture that. We've done some work to capture that in terms of time. And now we're working to quantify that in terms of kind of monetary uh, efficiency savings. Uh, similarly, uh, for patients, the, the app provides quick, easy access to services like prescriptions and appointments, uh, making the healthcare more accessible and convenient for them. So we've done some um, uh, work to also look at the uh, kind of the, the benefits to, to patients, and it kind of fits with all sorts of uh, elements of empowering patients, giving them greater agency over their health and their health data too. So there's some important. Um, uh, really behind uh, and they are very important. So uh, currently the uptake can be an SSG of 60% uh, in terms of people with downloaded the NHS app that are eligible to do it and that's those ages over 30. That's actually gone up to 61% uh, over the last uh, month or so, so a bit of work that we've already done uh, and that's above the national average. But on the next slide we can see that there's still huge scope as Debs has described to both increase kind of uptake of the app overall but also to flick that switch uh, and get people to turn the notifications on which mean that the messages that they do receive from the GP and from uh, the acutes as Debs has described default to the app rather than going via SMS to then helping to reduce that cost. And within the papers and within the slides um, there is uh, some Sankey diagrams that describe that in a lot more detail and basically what we're showing here is what we want to shift from uh, defaulting via SMS because notifications are off or because people don't have the app to being uh, via the NHS app. So we're trying to shift this uh, red and, and purple here into the green. And that's kind of the scale of the opportunity uh, at the moment within just within the general practice messaging and there's some figures there relating um, to that. So how we've kind of gone about doing that or started to going about doing that, we initially through the, again the discovery work we've begun to understand some of the um, kind of barriers and obstacles in the way of uh, uh, that are preventing people currently fully realising and using the NHS app, um, including digital exclusion, lack of trust in digital solutions, varying levels of varying levels of digital literacy, um, and then we've begun to work with um, closely with partner organisations, so the Good Things Foundation and the VCSE Alliance to um, actively improve digital inclusion, uh, ensuring that no one is left behind in the transition to the NHS app um, and help identify the best partner organisations to reach the populations with significantly lower uptake to ca actively counter digital exclusion. So while we want to increase overall levels within the population of, of app usage, we also want to narrow that gap that we've seen. And again, there is a, a slide that relates to the gap that we see in our population uh, in terms of uptake uh, and the kind of demographic information that we are uh, seeing as, as being associated with that. None of it will be a, a huge surprise um, to anyone, I don't think. So um, I really wanted to then move on to the system uh, kind of element of this. So uh, a lot of the discovery work and the work we've done to date and that's contained within the paper relates to general practice and the benefits we've identified within general practice. But really, um, systems within BNSSG are all at different stages, sorry, partners within BNSSG are all at different stages of the NHS app. Um, and as Deb said, UHPW MBT have integrated the app with their patient portal, Doctor Doctor, but others are still exploring uh, how to best use it. And we're wanting to kind of facilitate and share learning about how to, how to um, integrate your patient um, engagement portals 
into into the NHS app and really encouraging that. So we need a kind of a system wide coordinated approach to maximise the full benefits that we're uncovering of the NHS app. And, and as more functionality comes online, uh, that benefit will only increase. Um, and, and that kind of requires a system buy in really that we're all bought into the NHS app becoming the cornerstone that supports any initiatives and kind of the, the, the channel by which any initiatives that rely on communication between uh, provider organizations and their patients kind of goes by. Uh, and again, that's a, a wider strategic point that we're working to, but that's that's what we're here to, to present as the direction of travel um, today. So um, in terms of where we're going next as a, as a, as a program, um, the discovery work to date has identified six quick wins, so we're trying to realise some of those cash releasing savings in the short term. So these include launching a local communication campaign to fit with the national one in October, uh, producing toolkits for GP practices. So we've already launched those and we've got some really positive and good feedback on them from the practices involved. Um, and engaging with underserved groups, um, so to help up, uh, help, again, help uptake across the population, not just um, in certain areas. So digital inclusion remains a, came, remains a key priority um, to ensure that underserved groups are not left behind, ensure that everyone, regardless of digital, digital literacy uh, or access, can benefit from the NHS app. Uh, and and a, a key element of that is also the standardisation of access. So um, we hear lots about different people having different experiences in accessing services, and the NHS app kind of, in some ways, provides a, a standardised approach for people to be able to have a, a similar experience of accessing uh, NHS and NHS services. Um, and then I've touched really on the, uh, the clear financial benefit of, of increasing app usage uh, in terms of SMS costs. Um, uh, and I'll probably leave it there, Deb. Again, the collaboration will be essential um, to achieve all these goals. And that's why we kind of need and are asking all partners to support this initiative and support uh, colleagues in your own organisations to, uh, to engage in the NHS app and to engage in this work. Thanks, Rhys. Thanks, Rhys. That's a really helpful update. Um, I thought I'm sure board members will have welcomed that. Is there any questions from board members for either Deb or for Rhys? So I've got uh, Ellen first and then Alison. Yeah, thanks for that update, Rhys um, and Deb. Um, just in practice, if you could, um, Rhys, give us some examples of what you mean by um, partners sort of buying in and what you're looking for from partners, please. Yeah, so Deb's talked earlier about, uh, so Doctor Doctor is the patient engagement portal used by the acute. It's also now recently been adopted by uh, by Serona, and uh, I know AWP also use it. So what we're really looking at is how we explore um, both as, as, as more functionality comes online, it can be used by the community organisation and by mental health and by the acute. That we're kind of um, really leading the way in terms of making sure we're integrating uh, and maximising our integration with the NHS app through that those existing systems. So we're not looking to replace existing systems. The NHS app doesn't do that. It's a way to channel those into one place. So everything from the GP through to the acutes and everything else is coming through one sort of face for the NHS. So um, there is functionality, as I say, that's becoming online with the gen with general practice more and more. We get more messages and more types of messages that we can push through. Um, we're still working and trying to work with colleagues uh, with, through the program board from Serona AWP and the local authorities to understand um, what functionality might be available to them at the moment that they're not currently using or, or working with national teams to kind of leverage relationships there to mean that we can push more functionality through. It's in service, in service, Ellen, of making sure that if you live in BNSSG, you have a really seamless yeah. user experience. Uh, yeah, but, but it's just been absolutely clear about what are you asking? Are there any are there any partners that we'd like to nudge a little bit more? I no, suppose. No, no. no. OK, it, it's Fine. just keeping it on the agenda. OK, thanks very much. Thank you. Very good update. OK, th th thanks, Alan. Uh, Alison. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. Very good. Really important update. I guess as individuals, we've all got a declaration of interest in the NHS app working well, haven't we? Um, two, two, two questions really. One is it really it, it clearly isn't equitable now because you have practices that aren't signing up to the full functionality. So we're not giving an equitable service to people across our patch, um, and that can't be that can't be right. So, it, but even if people are digitally enabled, if they're not having the full functionality, they'll switch off the app quite quickly. So, so there's a real need for people who are informed to keep them informed to give them the full functionality that the app offers because it's not fair in one place and not the other. The, the second bit, there's an awful lot of barriers you've put up here around why practices think people don't, patients, people don't sign up to it. Quite nice to 
to see what people think and why they don't sign up to it, as opposed to practices saying what people think. Uh, for example, English as a second language uh, it, it has been flagged as a barrier. What exactly are we doing in BNSSG to help people where English isn't the first language? Thank you. I completely agree on the first point and kind of one of the key, again, one of the kind of the, the reasons we're working directly with the GP practices is to standardise the level of functionality that is available so that everyone has a uh, the same opportunity to experience the app in that way. Uh, and that's why those toolkits have been developed. And, and Grace, Grace, who's the kind of project lead, is already out working with practices uh, that haven't uh, enabled that functionality, literally going in and working with staff to do that and, and talking about the benefits. Because it's not just about making them do it, it's also making them on board with doing it so that, again, they're then enabling it for their patients. Um, on the on the latter point, um, it, it's a really good one and an important one. Um, we're, I think we're probably we're trying to engage directly at the moment with um, the voluntary sector organisations already operating in these air, in the areas where we're seeing kind of low uptake in usage. I suppose you're completely right in terms of we're not necessarily directly interacting with the population themselves. You see, I mean, we're sort of using those organisations as a, as, a, as a as a proxy for then doing that. So we've definitely tried to do that, but maybe we could probably we can almost certainly do do more to, to reach out to the population directly. There's actually a, a relatively, at the moment anyway, through the discovery work, we found relatively limited information uh, from other areas of the country in addressing directly the barriers and, and kind of quant um, capturing directly the barriers that have been seen to the uptake in the NHS app. So there's not like loads of evidence out there at the moment. Um, I think it was one of the things we were, we were interested in. But And I think we've, we've got a link into the national team, Alison, to feed through uh, uh, our findings and also the piece that Reese flagged that they're engaging with the VCSE so that we're starting to connect with communities so that information will definitely come in time but what we've used this for at the moment is to know where to target um, our community efforts to make sure that we're connecting with people um, and then we'll hear those voices much more. Thank you so can I just be clear what what exactly are we doing with people where English isn't the first language? In terms of NHS app, that's something that's being yeah. picked up nationally. So the language piece is being picked up national. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Deb. Shane and then Jaya. Just a couple of things. Um, I'm delighted we're doing this at a regional, sorry, system level, and you know that. But for me, the bit that just seems a little strange. It's a national product, um, and I'm a user of Facebook, Instagram, X, all kinds of things. I've never once been asked through those channels. Have you got the NHS app and would you like to use it? I've been asked about propertynews.com. I've been asked about banking. I've been asked about everything you could ever imagine under the sun. But in all the time I've used those platforms, I've never once been asked, do you have the NHS app or some? So there's something about influencing up about using technology to get those who are technology enabled to use the app. With another challenge for those who aren't technology enabled, but I have offers of all kinds of things on my on my social media. We all do. Never once in my life has anyone said, join the NHS app. So there is something about feeding up on that. The second thing then is we have a unique opportunity. Those who come to see us for care and help, we have that small window of opportunity to say, do you have the NHS app? Do you use it? You know, we have hundreds of thousands of people every day who come to interact with health and social care we have a unique opportunity now i appreciate people are unbelievably busy um but there's got to be some opportunity in that as well very rarely do you get your customer in front of you to be able to say do you have the app do you use it and if you don't right okay what are we going to do at that point so i think there's two points there's national influencing up and we have a unique opportunity because most of our users and customers actually interact once at a, at a point great points yeah we need to fold those in thanks Ch thanks shane uh Jaya. thanks I'm, I'm loving this i i really can see the potential in in getting all of this started uh, I'll, I'll come back to my my usual thing about the greatest touch point i can see from where i'm sitting is all, all about appointments because people spend so long on the phone waiting for appointments that's the point that's the pain point and if you can then say, have you tried our app? 
then you've got a real driver in there. But obviously not every GP surgery offers that. And I'm always frustrated because I go onto the app thinking, surely now, surely now. And I get this horrible sinking feeling when it's not now. And I, I, I slope off to my phone and then I don't make the call and we go through the whole cycle again. I think there's an opportunity if we can communicate when our GP surgeries are going to be connected up to this magical experience of making an appointment without waiting 45 minutes. I know that that would be a drive to get people to start to use it. We, we just need to look at the pain points. People are suffering enough to be driven to use it. We just have to tell them when. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's really helpful and I completely agree. And I think we've, we've seen within general practice, there is huge variation in how people can access those services, right? And, and, and in, some, in some of our areas, we, some of the GP practices um, have adopted some fantastic, I, I mean, I'm biased, some fantastic new digital ways of being able to, and it benefits everyone, it benefits, as you say, you're not sitting on the phone for 45 minutes, but also the practice can manage that workload so in such a, in such a more systematic way. So there's one about sharing, this way, sharing that ways of working and kind of developing that across all of the GP practices. But then there's the strategic bit about in, those systems don't all integrate into NHS apps. Then it's working with those suppliers to integrate them into NHS app. And that's where that Wayfinder bit that, that Deb's referred to is, is also really important. So there's, there's the two ends of it. But I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's just saying when, when people can expect it. And then at least um, you can say, well, at the very least, I can wait until June next year and I'll get my appointment then. But Okay, thanks, Rhys. Thanks, Deb. That's a really informative uh, update. I think on the paper we've been asked to to note the work that's gone support uh, so far and support what's uh, been discussed today about going forward. Uh, is there anything else anybody else wants to add before we move us on to the next item? My right, only, okay. My only thing, just, just Shane made a really good point about feeding it down. We've got all of these contacts, and if we can find a way to feed that down through organisations to promote the use of the app. Then please do, but that's a plea. I'm, I'm sure we will, Reese. Th th thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. Okay, um, why don't we take the next item on the corporate risk register and then just have a five minute break? I think people will probably benefit from stretching their legs a bit because um, there's a, still a few more items to go, and I want to make sure that we make some time for the the public questions as well. Um, so the next item is the corporate risk register. So I think Sarah, you're starting us off, but I think Nicole's probably joining us as well. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, so we haven't brought the corporate risk register to the board for a few months, and we've been going through a process of um, refreshing and cleaning it up, really. And really, that's the point we're at uh, for this board. It went to audit governance and risk in September, and um, it's here now, really, to um, to um, seek approval for the um, particularly to close the risks where they're proposed to be closed. Um, but also to draw the board's attention then to the ones that are remaining. I think once we've taken off the closed one is it becomes a more manageable uh, spreadsheet to look at in terms of and then to really focus in on. Um, just in terms of the, um, the, the risks that remain on there, these are very much more focused towards the ICB as a statutory organisation. And then there is more work going on in terms of um, starting to look at the system wide risks and I know that Nick's in the process of um, trying to get together system um, organisational risk leads to start bringing that together more formally. Um, but Nick, did you want to add anything specifically more? I think it was you've covered the, about the risks there, so it's it's clear which ones are recommended to be closed. So if we can have your approval to close those um, today, that will help us for tidying up. Um, we've also got uh, a couple highlighted in red, which are new since this um, corporate risk register was last presented. So again, it's just your acceptance of those risks. Um, but as Sarah said, this, this is um, a sort of stage in the tidying up of the corporate risk register and also an early step in the development of our system risk register as well. Um, and so we're, we're very much sort of on a, on a journey with that. So um, any um, so the comments um, would be welcomed as we as we go through that process. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. Can I can I open up for any questions, John? I don't know whether you've got any points. Ah, oh, you've put his hand up straight away. You read my mind, John. Uh, thanks, Chair. And just to um, to assure you, I think the comments that I want to make now, I would have been making under my audit chairs. Uh, so I, I, I won't I won't need that time. Um, I, just to say, we, we we met about three weeks ago. We had a really helpful discussion about um, about risk, and as as Nick has said, a lot of work has gone in uh, to you know to clean things up. 
And what's relevant about the meeting, the, the, the general tenor of the meeting was really around reset and refocus. And this year, we, although we maintained our substantial assurance um, in the annual head of internal order of opinion, we, we tracked to think a little closer to the bar than we would ideally have liked. So we know that we need to focus on delivery against the order recommendations, not letting the recommendations slip and delivering on the management um, actions. And what I wanted to just kind of share was that Nick has developed a really helpful tracking advice that enables us to, to get much better oversight of all of these areas. And, and we, we had an excellent uh, demo from Nick um, at the committee. It went, down, it went down really well. It's a tool and it needs to be put into effect, but it was great to, you know, it, it was really, you know, it was great to see it uh, coming together. Um, the, the paper also makes reference to um, to deep dives, and we felt on balance at audit and uh, and risk that rather than audit and risk being the kind of the focal point, it's important to ensure that uh, to ensure that all the committees are seeing, inputting, and challenging and taking assurance based on the respective areas um, of expertise. But really, helpfully, all of the committee chairs are members of um, of all the committees, so we've got that uh, we've got that additional um, check and balance. But the Sharing the, uh, the, the the deep dives really just kind of enables us to, to to more rapidly get more extensive coverage and get into the areas that we need to be focusing on. That that's all I wanted to say, and I won't have anything further to say, uh, Jeff. So you get you get ten minutes back a bit later. Hey, thanks, John. Thank you, uh, Ellen. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I think I'm probably going to reiterate what what John just said there. Um, it was really helpful at um, audit committee, John. Um, that Sarah cleared up the that there should be one um, risk register that is considered at audit and risk committee, and there would not be individual risk registers for committees. So that was re really helpful. Um, I think what would be useful, John and Sarah, is just being clear on how we are allocating those risks for deep dives, and just acknowledging the fact that we wouldn't want to. Um, over commit committees because there's you know there's obviously sort of quite full agendas as well but it'd be good to have some kind of process for that um, and just one practical note Sarah it would just be really helpful at the November meeting which I'm hoping is in person that perhaps we could have a three copies of this because then it would just be helpful for, for us to take away and just keep and and be able to refer to them sort of probably a little bit easier thanks yeah, thanks, Helen. I think, and I think we circulated it in email form as well this time. Yeah. Because I know how difficult it is to look on look at on diligence. So, uh, yeah, it's a good point, uh, Julie. Yeah, it's just a question. Really, you talked about Sarah the work on where do we put system risks that may not be fifteen. Where are they held at the moment? Because I know there are a few. I know we've escalated a few. So while we're doing that process, are we sure this? Being held somewhere, or have they gone into the ether? <laughs> so we have got a few, Julie, but I'm not convinced yet that that's a complete list. And that's part of, if you think about some of the discussion we had earlier about the infrastructure strategy, one of the things we need to make sure is that we are getting to that sort of coherent understanding of the risks across the system. You know, capital is one of those areas where we need to be understanding the the risks and, and making sure one that we've got consistency of scoring you know we know we've got some of those issues within the ICB but as you go across the system you've got to do that test and challenge which is why we're sort of looking to bring together uh, risk leaders across the system to, to do that work and to sort of test from individual risk registers what needs to be escalated into a system-wide position. Sorry, can I just come back on that? I get, I get the individual risk, but there are, as I understand it, there are some yes. where we've said this is a system-wide risk. A little bit of it might sit here, but a bit of it sits there. They are, somebody is managing. Do they then get allocated? Yeah. Somebody and, to lead? Yeah, no, absolutely. And Julie, yeah. we'll, what we'll do then is we will, as part of the next update we'll make sure that we bring back those ones that we have got held and where those are being reviewed yeah thank, thank you. you okay thanks but it's a good point julie thanks shane yeah just on that point julie what tends to have happened is if if the risk is about say no criteria reside and go back to the, the bigger it's been held in 
the ODG for unscheduled care, et cetera. But actually, that's not good enough. It needs to be at a senior exec level and then into, into, the, um, uh, into the board. Can I just raise one thing? It's a plea. We attempted to do the system risk work and we got all of the risk leads from around the, around the system and the organization. We've been around this, this track once, okay? And it became unbelievably complicated. Um, and it, it, it was, you know, we had lines feeding in from X, Y, and Z. It's a plea that we all take a common sense approach to this rather than a technical approach to this, so that we have a common sense approach to if we identify risk, it simply is escalated, and we have a place to hold, discuss, mitigate, and improve at a, at a, a system-wide level. Because we got ourselves in a slightly complicated process because we had um, all kinds of all really detailed complex. It's just a plea for, let's take a common sense approach as opposed to a really technical approach. Thanks, Shane. Any other comments or questions? So we've been asked to do uh, four things. Of course, receive the uh, risk register, note the details, accept the escalated risks, and note your approach to conducting the deep dive reviews uh, into directorates. So that's what we've been asked to do. Is everyone happy that we, we progress in that fashion? Okay, great. Nicole, thanks very much. Uh, as always, you, your grip around this is, is really good. I, I think it's really important for us. And John, thanks for the update and Sarah as well. Um, by me, it's just gone quarter past two. Can I suggest we just take 10 minutes, uh, come back at 25 past two, just a, just a chance for you to stretch your legs and come back in fresh for the last few items. And then we should still be finished by uh, half past three. Um, but if you are um, leaving your computer on, remember to turn your camera and your, your uh, microphone off if you can. See you at 25 past two.
Okay, I make it 25 past by me, so I'll I'll crack on if I can. There's still a few cameras that aren't on, but I'm sure they'll join us again very, very shortly. Um, the next two items on the agenda are policy changes. Uh, the nationally driven one, so I think they'll be fairly straightforward. But Shane, I think you're going to pick them up. So the first one is the ICB constitution. Thanks, you know, Chair. And as you say, they are relatively straightforward. We received notification in the end of July from NHSA about suggested amendments to the constitution. We've made those amendments. You can see in the paper um, some changes. The original constitution talked a lot about the establishment of the ICB. Clearly, we are now well established. Um, it talked about the importance of the senior non-executive member and deputy chair, both at committee, a particular committee level and also for the organisation as a whole. Um, and some of the wording was changed as well and then embedded the whole idea of planning, particularly the joint forward plan as a duty of the ICB. It's all in the document as track changes and there is a cover sheet. Um, as I say, it is technical. We have to do it. Um, we will also have to report them back to NHSE to say we have approved this today at our board and that, in fact, the technical the changes have been made. Happy to take comments or questions, Chair. OK, thanks, Shane. So open to any comments or questions. Uh, the paper self-explanatory, I think. Is there anything anyone wants to raise on it? No, so uh, oh, uh, Rob. Small, small matter, but um, we submit it to NHS England and I've got the necessary documentation to do that. Um, it doesn't actually become our constitution until it's approved by NHS England. So a small matter there of uh, just uh, technicality. OK, lovely. Thanks, Rob. Um, any other comments or questions? No, so I'm taking we're happy to uh, approve that as a change to the policy. And the second one then, Shane, was managing conflicts of interest. Yeah, and thank you, Chair. So um, linked to the first change in constitution, there's also reference to a change in the, the guidance with regards to conflict of interest. Um, you'll see in the paper. So this policy belongs to me. It's enacted through the Chief of Staff, through Rob. Um, and you see in the paper, we've made amendments to, with regards to the provider selection regime, etc. So there have been lots of conversations, obviously, at Fed and actually today, as we know, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of our private agenda. Um, and then other things in there in terms of clarifying the requirements at boards, et cetera, and subcommittees. Um, I know this has been already been reviewed at the audit committee. So, John, from your perspective, I, I'm assuming that the audit and risk committee were content. That's what I know to be the case. But I wonder whether there's anything you want to add to that, John. No, thanks, Shane. Uh, not, nothing to add. Uh, we, were content to, um, we were content to uh, endorse it. Um, so happy, I'm very happy with this. Thank you. So in that case, any other comments or questions? So I take you we're happy to agree. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thanks, so let, Chair. Me move, let me move us on to the um, committee updates then, starting with yourself, Ellen. And if you want to bring in uh, Joe or Dave uh, afterwards, that'd be great if you need to. But over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, I'll bring in Dave and also Joe if <laughs> on key points. Um, the last meeting was um, last week in September. The next meeting will take place in November. As well as discussing performance and quality, we received the annual safeguarding report, the SEND quarterly report. Um, a really sort of fascinating report on research, which um, Joe might sort of go into a little bit, and a discussion on LD and autism um, out of area placements. During safeguarding, probably the biggest issue that came up was data sharing, but I know that Rosie is in discussion with Deb and various colleagues on, on resolving that and making progress. Um, we also discussed winter planning that Shane mentioned earlier on um, and members questioned preparedness for winter. Dave's team um, assured the committee that planning was of the same level of, la of last year with additional initiatives on top. Um, and as a board, we'll see that next next month, as Shane mentioned. Um, the challenge that came back from the committee to the executive um, was in particular on community. Are we ready? Are we fully recruited? So that whole question of recruitment um, was important. And hopefully, Shane, um, I think that would be a really good, good part of the winter uh, planning to discuss at the next meeting, if we could. Um, I'm going to ask Dave to come in on uh, performance, but uh, just to touch on some points. Um, 
cancer, FDS, you know, having probably a year ago been really challenging about that position, we've made some excellent progress and the performance is now really good, as are our diagnostic testing, uh, where we are towards the top of the country. Elective 65-week waits, um, great progress from MBT. There's some challenges in UHBW, but that's predominantly focused on dental and corneal transplant transplant where there is a national tissue shortage. Um, urgent care, four hour very good trend, uh, just a few point, points off in terms of target um, and category two on target. Our challenge remains on no criteria to reside. We had a full conversation about that earlier um, and we discussed some um, significant actions on a sustainable solution. So that's my general sort of um, overview. Jeff, I'll just bring in Dave if I could to go into a bit more detail. Thank okay, you. Thanks, Ellen. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, um, Jeff. Thank you. So I and it's covered most of the key points. I just want to draw out from the report. Um, uh, in addition to what Ellen's noted, this the uh, hope. Uh, boards noted this we formally took to the performance report through the system executive group um, this month uh, in advance of OQPM system executive group being the coming together of our uh, chief executives in the system uh, who were able then to um, uh, view uh, the performance position and uh, assess those kind of key risks identified in the report um, and that was a, a, a helpful conversation step in our uh, process um, just in terms of performance, one area that I would just note that Ellen didn't mention um, is continued and sustained strong performance um, against our mental health standards, um, uh, predominantly through a AWP. Um, uh, it, there are uh, a head of target against um, uh, most uh, of the uh, mental health standard targets uh, and we're not um, uh, on target, going absolutely in the right direction. So um, credit to Dominic and his team for um, uh, improved performance in, around those standards. Um, I, I would just note um, as well, it's, it's drawn out in the cover paper uh, for the report, uh, other key areas uh, that SEG noted in terms of, of escalation um, uh, and just sort of board's uh, awareness. Ellen's already noted the uh, no criteria to reside position, uh, but also to note um, uh, challenge within the stroke pathway in our system um, at the moment, and we have flex capacity um, uh, to improve flow through uh, stroke services. Uh, we are also experiencing some challenge in our heart failure service pathway um, uh, and ongoing conversations between um, system partners, notably Serona uh, uh, and uh, MBT around uh, that uh, pathway uh, and flow, but one does the board should be uh, cited on. Um, uh, SEG was also, maybe we can come back to this uh, in our next board report, SEG was also keen uh, for us to f have a further deep dive uh, into children's services and uh, performance standards related to children's services, which we will do uh, next time and then on, on to the board. Um, and we also noted um, general practice collaborative uh, action uh, and risks. Uh, but if that's OK, Chair, I'll come back to that under Primary Care Committee. OK, uh, thank Chair, those are the other areas I was going to draw out. Thanks, Dave. Do, do you have anything to add? No? OK, uh, any comments or questions for... Ellen, Dave, or Joe. Uh, Dominic? Just um, two quick FYIs, and board members will probably have this in their consciousness, but it's just worth reminding. First, it's lovely to receive credit for um, the mental health performance, but of course, it's not just AWP, it's Feta, Feta Minds and uh, Devon Partnership around dementia as well. So it's a system uh, uh, set of metrics rather than just AWP. The, the second thing is that the, the long term plan metrics against which all mental health providers are held are actually relatively unambitious and I don't mean that they're not stretching for us to deliver they are stretching for us to deliver but they're based on uh, achieving a percentage of coverage of the population that none of us would ever be happy with so they take the whole population then those uh, suffering from those conditions and then they apply a percentage of people that they think is reasonable to be getting treatment given current resources well that's quite a low percentage so for example in children and young people it's about 50 percent of children and young people who need mental health services are getting them so what we should we shouldn't be complacent we need to stretch our ambitions and look at what we can deliver more of and more quickly thanks dominic that's really helpful any other comments or questions around the uh, quality report. 
No. OK, thank you. Uh, Jay, a people committee. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so the most recent people committee was last week and we received the usual updates on workforce monitoring, provider updates um, on their temporary staffing and resourcing recovery plans and NHS at home. So the financial position remains a challenge, as you all know. Partners working very, very hard um, uh, to ensure that they are off framework and agency use um, compliant. Um, it's worth saying that we should be really, really proud of the work being done across the system on nursing week hard, which is now fully compliant. And now we're moving to tackle medical and dental and more specialist work areas. Um, work has begun this month to attempt to correlate additional bank agency use. Um, bank and agency use during times of heightened escalation to identify any partners and um, potential mitigations against additional spend. So it's in very early stages at the moment, but we'll report back by the strategic workforce oversight group. Workforce monitoring against key indicators of staff and post um, vacancies, turnover, sickness and bank and agency usage remain on plan at present. There are lower levels of sickness across the summer as we anticipated and winter arrangements are now in place and will be monitoring. Um, the committee heard uh, from the NHS at home team as well, um, having supported recruitment activities that were flagged by the performance committee. So Ellen, thanks for that. Uh, the team were able to share that recruitment has now taken place and additional staff are joining as of this week. The, the, the MOU created by a collaborative group, including um, trade union colleagues, has enabled both the recruitment and clarity of roles and responsibilities being shared across system partners. This work is now being used as proof of concept for wider system work on the staff move, on, on um, staff movement coming uh, over the coming year. So that's pretty fantastic. Um, also, um, probably more relevant um, to previous discussions about how we can try and um, uh, tackle some of the no criteria to reside resourcing issues. Um, we received a presentation from colleagues in, in um, local authority partners on the workforce strategy for adult and social care. Um, many synergies and areas of potential joint working, um, particularly around learning and skills development, were identified. And the social care workforce um, will be a key feature in the people and culture plan. Um, as I mentioned in the previous meeting, um, it's in currently under development, as we know, um, uh, but it's, it's one of those high priorities now that we strengthen social care, we strengthen BCSE, because as a system, we work better. Um, I'm just checking to see whether or not we have um, Nicola or Corey in. Um, I'm here, Jay. Oh, Nicola, do you want to yes. come in a little bit um, and say something about um, uh, social care and workforce? Yeah, thanks. Um, it was really good at the People Committee to have that um, launch um, notes from the social care workforce strategy. Um, as part of our people and culture plan, we are we very much know that we can't. Um, do anything without our social care VCSE and primary care colleagues um, and we recently had a scoping meeting with our colleagues um, all together and it's progressing really quite nicely. The um, one example of things we're doing is trying to support that movement of staff by considering how we do look at skills sharing between the community and the queues etc. So um, that collaboration is is beginning and Hopefully, we will show some progress very soon. Thanks, Nicola. And Corey, are you able to say just a little bit about social care data and um, how we're trying to make use of it via our committee? Uh, certainly. Thank you, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, board members. Um, so, I'm Corey Hartman, the uh, workforce lead, the ICS workforce lead. Um, so, so, we, as Dan mentions regularly in our reporting, we include social care uh, workforce within those numbers. It is challenging in comparison to our, our health partners in, in the frequency and regular updates of that data, but it is something we're aware of and it is something that we are trying to improve. We're also certainly engaging with skills for care around um, a community of practice, you know, take some of the expertise about the short term strategic workforce planning, uh, linking up with NHS England. So as a region and as an ICS coming together and so how we can work together to help um, you know, plan what is the workforce that we need for the future. Um, it, it's very early days. We had our first meeting just, just last week post of the publication of the social care strategy, but I think it's a very exciting space that we can start to work closely with social care and health because fundamentally you know, we work hand in hand in order to deliver the, the care that we need. Thank you, Corey. Um, it's just worth noting that I know that there have been early discussions on um, 
uh, resourcing and um, how how to sort of help tackle from from partners no criteria to reside um, but I think once we've got a clear direction it'll be easy to work out where we what part we play um, from the people committee side of things um, and playing into the other committees uh, finally the only thing I wanted to say again is that um, at the last meeting we were starting to get some real um, synergies um, and sharing of best practice and collaboration opportunities um, with our partner reports so keep it coming please keep encouraging um, your NEDs uh, from across all our partners to uh, to attend because uh, it's starting to take real really good shape so i'm quite excited about that that's my update thank you all uh th th thanks chair and uh, thanks to nicola and to corey as well um any comments or questions for anybody shane and ellen uh it's just to note jay and i've spoken to joe hicks about this it's myself and jeff and uh and others went to visit the southwest ambulance service last week and the conversation with swast was about the ability for paramedics to also be part of a system way of thinking and working because quite clearly the piece of work we've looked at to begin with has you know potentially looked at acute community staff being able to work in and across but actually by the nature of paramedics um they're the perfect profession to work across primary secondary uh, and pre-hospital and therefore just to see how we can bring them in I've, I've raised it with Joe and I think it would be important from a people committee perspective we also look at how paramedics may become part of our future with regards to workforce they also are over prescribed for undergraduate courses um, and therefore yeah. yeah let's let's grab people who want to work in the health service uh, absolutely yeah. uh, that's that's really Fantastic, especially given that the dynamic has been usually if a GP can't come out to see somebody, paramedics usually end up saying, well, we'll take them to hospital, then they get stuck in hospital and it all comes around again. Um, and they definitely have a part to play, especially if we can try and mitigate risk between between the different handover points. So fabulous. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Um, Ellen? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I just want to say thanks to um, Jaya for um, just responding to that NHS at home. I think that's just an example of, of committees working across really well. Um, and just to, uh, men to mention, Jaya, that that, that um, NHS at home feeds directly into no criteria to reside. So you're already yeah. having an impact on that and the solution to that. And also your Thank oversight you. of workforce recruitment towards um, winter planning is also really helpful. So just thanks for those two things. Well, thank you to all our team doing a fantastic job. Thanks, Ellen. And, and I mean, I was gonna make that point, Ellen, about uh, NHS at home. Um, see, haven't seen the presentation at the last People Committee. It was really inspiring and people felt massively enthusiastic about system working. They recognized how hard it is, how it's much harder than just doing things in your own organization. But they were really up for it. And it was just it was probably one of the best examples I've seen since I've been in this role of collaboration across the system where people generally wanted to come together. It was it was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, I would I would suspect we probably haven't got time to have the whole presentation at the board here. But actually, a, a snapshot of that maybe for your, yourself or for Joe next time, Jaya, I think would be really helpful because yeah. I think people would be if you haven't seen it, you'd be very impressed about how our, our staff are coming together as one for the benefit of our our patients so it was it was just a great piece of it was a great piece of work and it was something i i knew about but i hadn't been cited on yeah. it from our practitioners who were so enthusiastic so yeah brilliant piece of work Definitely any other qu any other questions for for jaya no okay great thanks very much steve i'll pass thanks. on to you then finance estates and digital thanks jay oops uh, thanks, Jeff. So in the pack, uh, you've got the August position and August minutes. The committee met uh, on the 1st of October um, and the big items on the agenda for then were uh, approving an infrastructure strategy, which has been a fantastic piece of work across the system uh, that was signed off this morning uh, by the board. And that gives us an opportunity to prioritise our capital expenditure as a system that's really positive and the other thing uh, that was for approval yesterday was the abortion care services procurement approach which was also uh, approved the main item i just want to touch on now is that the financial position that we can see there we always knew that this year was going to be the tough year uh, and that it was really important that we delivered on all of our um 
promises in terms of savings so that we maintained a picture uh, for the organisations and the system as we go into uh, next year. If we don't do that, then there are significant consequences, both in terms of funding that we would receive um, from NHSE, but more importantly, NHSE uh, would be uh, scrutinising much more closely and external consultants would be with us. So we're trying to ensure that that doesn't happen and that's really important for us. You can see that at the moment in the reports that we are uh, tracking a deficit uh, at the moment at 12 point, nearly 12.4 million. And that's uh, a conversation that we were having yesterday uh, in the board to make sure that everybody is focused on recovering that position. Now, the good news is that this was something that we spotted a couple of months ago. And what we've managed to do is to hold a position so it's not deteriorating, but we're not making progress on closing the gap. And therefore the focus is now very much across the system uh, with CUTE providers, the ICB, um, to make sure that we do close the gap. And that was something that was discussed uh, at the board and we'll continue to monitor that very closely because once that starts to drift even further away, it becomes more and more difficult for us to achieve our goals uh, across the entire year. The risks remain uh, much as they have uh, over the past few months in that we've got three main risks that are still open. Clearly financial challenges faced by ourselves, local authorities, which could impact on um, uh, our position and, and in particular around adult social care costs and uh, unfunded cost pressures. We've also got some issues around funded care placements and the management of in-year costs and non-emergency patient transport providers. So those are risks that remain open and we continue to uh, monitor those and mitigate. Um, so at the moment, my main message is that our focus is very much on trying to ensure that we deliver the break even that we set sail with when we set our budget. And that is a system wide uh, agenda and all of the system is now focused on helping us do that. Thanks, Steve. And I'll, I'll bring Sarah in a moment. I, th I think it's worth stating for the for the public record, you know, as a system, we're better than most around the country in the way we're managing finances. But there is more to do. And we had a lot of conversation at the Finance, Estates and Digital Committee this week. And of course, this morning at Private Board in the detail about the things that we can and should be doing. So um, w whilst we, we are, I wouldn't say in a better place than others, but certainly making more progress, we've still got a bit to do. But um, Sarah, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Um, I think Steve said most things. I, yeah. I guess just my only reflection is that it is a tricky place to be being better than others, but not on plan because we still need to be on plan. And it's that bit that we've got to, you know, keep our focus because there's still as much risk for us as a system in terms of losing the incentive that we are um, planning for in next financial year. So it is that's sort of, a, you know, I know it's really tough and I'm not suggesting that this isn't difficult for all staff in all of our organisations that are having to try and reduce costs. But but that is um, the reality. And we know that there's so much to, you know, so much to win in terms of uh, keeping on track with that, both in terms of our autonomy to operate locally and also the incentive payments that we will receive next year. So so you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, Sarah, because benchmarking is useful information for us. But absolutely, mm. that's not a target. And the target has mm. to be continuous improvement. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, 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 you made that point well. Thank you. Shane. I think it's important also for the public record, uh, Chair. We have the Performance and Recovery Board. We know what the challenges we have to face. The Performance and Recovery Board is the place where all our providers come together to work with us in the ICB to understand what we've got to do to bridge that gap. The Performance and Recovery Board, we're meeting again this week. Um, sorry, this month, and then we will be looking at the choices we may have to make um, if we are to find our way back to the break-even position. As I said before, I think that's likely to be in the November board meeting, Chair, but I think it's important for the public record that we have a process and we're going to work that process and bring that back to the board. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Uh, so any other comments or questions 
before I move us on to the primary care update. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Alison. Thanks very much, Jeff. Uh, we haven't had a primary care committee since last board. There's one in a couple of weeks. Um, and I know Dave wants to update the board on potential collective action. Just to remind board members that primary care committee does see the detail behind this and we've got good assurance of the systems and processes in place, system-wide working <coughs> together. And the thing that also has shone through uh, is the, the, the maintenance of the relationships uh, between partners, because that will that will be important once any collective action has come and gone. Um, and I particularly, because Maria's here and Julie's here, your non-executive directors are, are such an important part of committee, and and I just they just feel a really big part of the team. I just want to thank you on, on committee's behalf for both of them. But I'll hand over to Dave for any collective action update. Alison, just on that point, sitting across all the committees, I, I, I think more and more our NED members from across our different organisations are making a massive contribution. And um, it's something I've been planning to do, but I think I do need to do in the next few months is bring all NEDs back together to talk about system. Um, because I think actually some may be a little bit blindsided on what's happening and what their colleagues are doing in our committees as well. So, um, yeah, point well made. Uh, Dave. Uh, thank you, Chair and Alison. So um, this is just a verbal update um, uh, today. You remember that Bev attended our last meeting with a full uh, uh, update and paper, and we'll come back to our the next meeting with a formal update. But I did just want to cite board members on what's happened uh, since we last met. Um, I was going to start by reiterating the point that Alison's made, that we continue to uh, ma maintain um, uh, excellent collaborative working between ourselves and the LMC and One Carer and practices in our in our uh, approach and response uh, to this. It's a really transparent and open uh, approach that's being uh, taken. Um, I think the key the key point of note since we last met and uh, was noted in Bev's update is that it was a meeting of all practices um, uh, with the LMC on the 10th of September to discuss the proposed actions. Um, those proposed actions or that discussion was uh, collated and reviewed um, uh, by the LMC uh, and a summary of kind of agreed uh, actions has been shared uh, with practices uh, with a, uh, a rollout of potential action um, should practices wish to take that um, commencing as of now um, with further actions to be uh, uh, implemented over the coming um, over the coming months. So so as of now, um, practices are um, uh, are able to move to uh, 25 appointments per day, which is obviously a, a change in capacity uh, for uh, practices. Um, uh, and over the next couple of months, uh, further steps st such as using a standardised referral form um, uh, and looking at areas of work that would deem to be uh, unfunded uh, against core contract um, uh, to commence uh, in, the, in the new year. Um, so we continue to work with the LMC and One Care and System partners um, on looking at and developing our uh, mitigating actions in response to that uh, collaborative uh, action. Uh, we are doing our own assessment of the individual uh, practice response because um, uh, it's still up to individual practices to decide um, how they wish to um, uh, implement those proposed uh, actions. Um, uh, and we continue to work with system partners on, on developing response, I've already, I've already said. We're also completing an EIA and uh, EHIA against each of the actions and mitigations. Um, and once we've concluded that work um, and developed our full risk assessment, it'll that be that that comes before uh, primary care committee uh, next month uh, and the board for, for, for further assurance. Um, but I did just want to cite uh, the board today on that kind of next step um, uh, and development of action. Thank you, Chair. Oh. OK, thanks, Dave. It's a shame that Ruth's had to leave us and John couldn't make it this afternoon either because they may have given us a better understanding of general practice and where it's at. Uh, but is there anybody else who'd like to comment or ask any questions around the primary care update? No? OK, thank you very much. So the final one is the Integrated Care Partnership. Uh, both Shane and Fiona were with me at the last partnership board meeting last week. Um, and there's a real sense of enthusiasm there. I think people really are coming together. We're doing something different in our area, having the local authorities chairing it and rotating the chair there, which gives it a different dynamic. Um, and I think uh, whilst that has its challenges at times, I think it's for the benefit of the way we're doing things. 
A couple of things I wanted to update you on. One is there was a fair bit of discussion there, of course, in the local authorities' financial position and the difficult times they're facing. And that's been reflected in our conversations this morning. The second was about uh, the 2040 uh, update that we've had at board here today. That was received really well at the ICP and they made some very favourable con contributions about uh, what they thought needed to be done. Um, there was an appeal for us to have another session between the ICB and the ICP next year um, to we make sure we're not duplicating effort. I don't think we are, um, but that was important. And then the final one, which is probably the most important one really, was around the localities update. So you may be aware that we are currently doing a review of our locality partnerships and how they're working. And this was partly driven by the fact that with the 30% cuts, we had to reduce the number of directors in our locality partnerships to flat down from six to three, but that wasn't the only reason. Um, and so that process is ongoing at the moment. So we had a facilitated session um, for about 45 minutes. Actually, it was a day session squeezed into 45 minutes, I think. Um, but it was some really rich discussion in there. And I know myself and Fiona had a conversation afterwards about um, how do we as a board, how are we cited on the activity of our locality partnerships? Because they feed into Dave, uh, who does the day-to-day -day organization running and support. Um, but how is that coming into us as board members? Not necessarily for direction, but to ensure that we are hearing the good work that, that's going on in our locality partnerships and we're getting some consistency where consistency is appropriate. So, Fiona, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. Um, I don't know whether on that point, whether you, whether you've got anything, any observation on that, because I, I think we had we did have a good conversation, didn't we? We did. We had an incredibly rich conversation and I was fortunate to attend one of the workshops and I'm I'm going to be going to another workshop in a couple of weeks. Um, one of my takeaways was that disconnect um, of uh, the locality leads, uh, both the directors, but also the chairs um, being connected with both the integrated care partnership, uh, but also with the board. So one of the suggestions is that we have a standing item for localities on the ICP, as we do for health and wellbeing boards, as we're also requesting for the VCSE Alliance as well. So it it um, that communication loop is is connected, but it's also how localities feed into this board as well, because there's a wealth of stuff that's going on at locality level. With the rich conversation that we've had today um, with the DARSI review, um, with the transformation programme that, that Deb has presented, um, I think our locality partnerships are key. Um, one of the comments, and um, not wanting to put Shane on the spot, but was the fact that you you suggested the localities are part of the architecture if not the architecture of that delivery particularly at the grassroots and lo local element and also our localities have that insight and knowledge that we wouldn't necessarily get at this system-wide level so you you know that i am really quite passionate about localities. I sat on the Woodspring board for a number of years and I was there, you know, as it was being developed. And I've just seen the wealth of work that's been going on at that that level. And my concern was that we were going to have some amnesia around all the great work that was done, particularly during COVID, um, and we wouldn't want to lose that. So um, absolutely great piece of work that's been going on in relation to the review but I, I do think as I said last week we need to we need to connect and make sure that we've got the reporting mechanism um, and I also know that localities would really want to celebrate the work that they're doing and for it to be cited at this level. Yeah thanks Fiona that's really helpful. Uh, Shane? Yeah just on that point Fiona I'm hoping that the review itself calls out some of the things we can do to great, create greater connectivity between the existing ICP, ICB and localities. Um, I'm, I'm really conscious. I, I, I was at the workshop, which is great. I'm also meeting with Oliver and company next week and I'm going to go to the workshops as well. I think we have to create, and I use the term in the workshop and you know that, it is the delivery architecture. Okay, So if it's an important piece of delivery architecture, on this screen, we've got other mega pieces of delivery architecture through our acutes, our mental health, our local authorities. 
but we don't have our localities. Okay, so so it is a really important part of the review to understand the line of sight to delivery architecture. I think we have to be really careful. There's potential um, informing, then there's also delivery, and then there's governance. And I don't want to choke them with governance. I don't want to. I don't want to end up choking the localities with governance. But I think line of sight is required, and that's. I'm hoping that the review will help to bring that out. Shane, I know, I know we've talked about it on, on a number of occasions. I think you're absolutely right. We do need to make sure that we've got updates and oversight at this board. So, so I'm not saying we have a big update uh, each time. You, you know the agenda is just too full. We wouldn't get it in. We've tried to do it by having at the start of this meeting where we had update from locality partnerships. But I have to say I'm not cited enough as the, on the activity within our locality partnerships. What's working well, what, what's not working well. I think you're absolutely right, Shane. I think that fluidity and the ability to allow people to get on with things has to be there, albeit there's lots of money going in there, or there's money going in there as well. So that has to have a, a line of, of governance and scrutiny. Um, and then, of course, that Dave will help with that. But it'll be interesting to see that when the review comes back, where what sort of recommendations we see for some of that. But it's just to make sure people were updated on that, because I think um, it's another part of the jigsaw that probably needs to be slotted in in a, in a different way it's there it's happening but i think we're not necessarily cited on it dave i, I don't want to get into the full debate on this one today jeff that's the purpose purpose of the review but just to note note in terms of our governance we've worked hard to align our locality partnerships to the health and care improvement groups um, and a lot of the good work that we that is going on is reported through the community health and care improvement group we reviewed some uh, really helpful um uh, cases for improvement uh, l last month. Um, so so we, ha we have kind of finessed the governance around the health and care improvement groups for our localities, uh, but maybe in doing so, Jeff, that's then disconnected it from the board. So um, I, I just want members to be aware that we have got that line through the health and care improvement groups, um, um, but, but we'll see what the review says. Yeah, D Dave, and it's just making that point that Shane made, which is there's governance and scrutiny which is important, but the important part about update activity and valuing the work that's going on in our locality partnerships, because I think as board members, we should be cited on that and valuing what, what they're actually doing. But yet you are right. We're in danger of diving into the discussion that, as uh, I said, um, it was a day's work in 45 minutes, and I'm now trying to do it in about two minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, that, thanks for reining me back in. Um, any other comments or questions around the integrated care partnership? No, okay, so um, we've got questions from members of the public. We, we've had three already tabled with us, uh, which are generally around the green agenda. I, I'll read them out and I think Sarah, you may have a response for this. So the first one was, what was the amount of funding provided by the ICP to a partnership with uh, VCSE Catch Project to set up long-term program of support for implementing green plans and connect into the VS, uh, VCSE sector? Number two, what was the amount of funding provided by the ICB to deliver energy and green plan progress audits to identify opportunities for energy savings to enable primary care to develop um, business cases to work to work with third parties to implement plans to decarbonize their estate and to whom was the funding provided? And then finally, what further funding does the ICB plan to provide to VCSE organizations and GP practices to support the implementation of green plans. So um, quite a lot in there conversation wise. Sarah, can we update on those now or do we need to do, do it in writing? I can update certainly on the first two. So um, so the funding that was provided to the um, to that partnership with the VCSE catch project was £20,000. Um, the second one in terms of the um, audits um, in terms of understanding what the opportunities were was 47,000 and that was awarded to Covia Consulting Limited. Um, we don't currently have any other commitments um, to, um, to VCSE and practices in terms of supporting the implementation of green plans, uh, but that's further funding opportunities are being explored. And that was really the purpose of doing the work in terms of understanding what the opportunities were was to be able to look at what those potential opportunities could be with third parties. 
Okay, thanks, Sarah. Uh, and then, uh, Lucy, have you responded? In, I presume those three questions came from the same person. Uh, I think it might just be helpful to, to, to send them a note back to say it was discuss, uh, uh, discussed at the board and Sarah provided it, uh, an update. Um, but I don't know if they've joined us today online or whether it, it was just um, questions that came into you via email. They just came in via email, Jeff. So I'll um, I'll send a copy of the response um, and let them know that it will be included in the minutes as well. OK, great. Thanks very much. Um, so at this point, we're a bit ahead of time, but any other business? No? OK, well, can I thank everybody for their, their time today? Um, I know we've covered a lot of ground. I'm, I'm sure people are fairly uh, exhausted by it, but I think it's been very fruitful and we've had some really good conversations. So thank you as always. Hopefully next time we're meeting in person, it'd be great to see you all again soon. Thank you all for your time. See you soon.